uh, as chair. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Turko Tajik conference. Um, allow me to present our chair for the first panel, the morning panel, Ferhat Chirke. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chirke. And today we're going to have a interesting interesting uh, panel for you, starting with Persianisms and perversions among late Ottomans, which reflects how the Persian language was inflected in a discourse of sexual vice and sexual impropriety and how it was expressed in the late Ottoman period. This is uh, going to be delivered by Eric Blackthorne. Morning, Eric. And the second is going to be Languages of Pre-Modern Islamic Political Thought. I'm very happy to uh, introduce you a very old friend, uh, Dr. Mohammed al Merheb, who is joining us from Groningen. I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing the university name, but I can't, I can't do as Roy did. Hello, yeah. Mohammed. Hello, hi. Hi, Amir. And the third and last speaker will be uh, Dr. Mohammed Ali Dinakhil. He's joining us from Peshawar, and he will be speaking on the promotion of Turkey to the status of Persian and Arabic. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Chike and... Uh... Uh, all right, well, I don't have too much to do now. It's just to, you know... Uh... <laughs> ask uh, Eric to commence his talk. Uh, I'll, I will alert you like uh, 35 minutes into your talk, you know, uh, about the time, so anyway. Great, Great. thank you so All much. Right. <laughs> yes, right. it's a, uh, forgive me if I'm a little groggy, it's uh, 4 a.m. where I am, so uh, quite early. <laughs> um, but yeah, let me share my screen and Okay, can everyone see that okay? All right, perfect. So here, let me start. Um, yeah, I'm definitely approaching, uh, you know, this topic from a slightly different angle today. So I'd be really interested to hear your comments and all of your thoughts. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll just start. So in the fall of 1911, Several prominent members of Istanbul's literary community received a rather aggressive questionnaire in the mail. Posted by a new politically radical group of writers based in Salonika, the self-proclaimed Genç Kalimler, or Young Pens, the questionnaire consisted of a series of leading questions which essentially argued that Istanbul literati had failed in their task of developing an authentic, original Turkish literature. Instead, they continued to resort to the cliched poetic tropes of Ottoman divan literature to archaicizing expressions and phrases, and above all, to grammatical constructs and forms borrowed from Arabic and Persian. The literary, literary critique of the Genç Kalimler was fundamentally framed in biological terms. The Turkish language, they argued, was suffering from a sickness, hasta look, and those who looked to, supposed, to the supposed past for a cure were guilty of nothing less than obstructing natural evolution. If the precise relationship between literary form and sociolinguistic sickness was somewhat undefined, what actually were the symptoms of this disease and what were its case studies? Earlier that year, the main ideologue of the Genç Kalimler had written an article on precisely this question. Omer Seyfettin's brief polemic, Yeni Lisan, or New Language, had been published in the eponymous journal of the Genç Kalimler movement in April 1911. In it, he aimed to give an account of both of the sicknesses of Ottoman Turkish and the form of its eventual cure. Seyfettin proposed that the history of Turkish literature could be divided into two broad imitative mentalities. One, towards Iran, which would characterize a high Ottoman culture, and a newer turn towards France, among the literary avant-garde. Although he found both ultimately problematic, Seyfettin's venom was primarily directed at the influence of Iran, in part because he felt it more deeply rooted in the constitution of Ottoman Turkish, and in part because he felt that those authors of the Francophile tendency, most notably the writers and poets of the Edibiata Jadida or New Literature Movement, 
or in any case, largely reproducing Persian and artifice and complexity through their attempts at European literary modernity. In connecting Persian grammatical forms, expressions, and vocabulary to a notion of literary artifice, Seyfetin was essentially in agreement with much of the Orientalist criticism on the matter, um, and then, as it was described so well by Eric John Akiol in his presentation yesterday, we find the same rhetorical link in E.J.W. Gibbs' History of Ottoman Poetry, the final volume of which was published in 1909. Yet when it came time for Seyfetin to give literary examples of where this Persian influence had manifested in the full-blown sickness, his judgments were remarkably different from those of Gibb. In Yeni Lisan, Seyfetin provided five direct instances of this sickness. These were the poems Hamam Name by the early 18th century poet Nedim, Chef Kengiz by the late 18th century poet Sunruzade Vehbi, Huban Name by his contemporary Endurunu Fazobe, and two 19th century works, Name Idil by Osman Rahmi Effendi, and the play Hedar by Mualam Naji. And when you think in terms of Seyfetin's literary prescriptions, notably the excision of complex Persian and Arabic derived grammar and vocabulary, and the reconnection of high literature with what he regarded as the vitality of the Istanbulite urban vernacular, it's difficult actually to find much of a link between these works. The poetry of Nadim and Endurun Fazl, for instance, were conceived by Gibb and likewise by both 19th and 20th century literary historiography as movements towards the very urban vernacular for Omar Seyfetin valorized. Nadim, by incorporating the geography of the city heavily into his works and bringing in more popular poetic forms like the Sharka, and Fazl Bey, by in practicing new dimensions of poetic autobiography and verisimilitude to daily urban life. Although some of Nadim's most well-known verses were written in a mode of poetic competition of Iran, these were highly persophilic in content. Indeed, his famous line that a single stone of Istanbul was worth all the lands of Iran seems a phrase ripe for appropriation by the Genç column there. The case for Vehbi is a little bit clearer. His 1783 Persian Ottoman rhyming dictionary, Tufei Vehbi, which was sarcastically described by Seyfetin in the text as a great service to Turkish literature, was widely used as a school textbook for learning Persian vocabulary throughout the 19th century. He was well known for his fluency in Persian. He served as part of a diplomatic mission to the court of Karim Khan Zand, that would actually inspire a later verse travelogue, the Kaside uh, i Tanane. Yet in its comparative mode, Tanane is hardly that different from the comparative poems of Nadim. The emphasis is similarly on the superiority of the Ottoman state over the relative poverty and political weakness of the Zand, and on aggrandizing the Ottoman dynasty as the true heirs of the Shahname derived kingly tradition. Osman Rahmi and Mualim Naji, as two supposedly traditionalist poets of the 19th century, we seem to align even more with Seyfetin's linguistic prescriptions, yet Name Idil is in form largely a conservative but otherwise unremarkable Mesnevi, whereas Mualim Naji's Heder is a wholly European style two act stage play, with little formal relationship either to the conventions of Divan literature or the Ottoman theatrical tradition. Instead, as Seyfetin makes clear, what linked these works to Iran and made them case studies of Persian literary sickness was their shared eroticism. In particular, the central poetic motif of what Seyfetin describes in archly Persianate terms as the hot avar char ebru, with both phrases referring to the incipient mustache of the young male beloved. Constructing a psycho-historical theory of Turkish literature, Seyfetin argued that the primeval nomadic Turks, like the contemporaneous Bedouin Arabs, had possessed an authentic, healthy, and natural heterosexuality which had given an innate vitality to both Turkic folk poetry and the Arabic poets of the Jahiliya period. In both cases, Seyfetin argued, this had been lost in the course of the traversals of the decadent civilization of Iran. Indeed, under Iranian influence, Turkish vitality had been sublimated into the world of Ottoman divan literature. As he wrote, quote, unable to make true love, poets began to fall into fantasies. The end result of this fantastic imagining was that the Ottoman literati took as their desired objects only images of themselves. They regressed, he argued, as a result of the Persian over-civilization into further and further realms of narcissism. And so despite Seyfetin's actually rather limited program of linguistic reform, the true radicality of Yeni Lisan was to link Turkish literary modernity to the institution, or for Seyfetin, the recovery of heteronormativity. 
a project further taken up by other authors in following years. In the process, the Persian myth and the modes of deprecated desire rhetorically associated with it was placed fundamentally in the position of the non-normative, or to use the term of contemporary theory, the queer. As I argue in the first part of my dissertation project, four late Ottoman intellectuals and writers like Umar Seyfettin, as well as for his predecessors and contemporaries like Ahmed Mithat Efendi and Halide Adib Adavar, it was above all the influence of Iran and the lingering presence of Persianism that served as the imminent internal contradiction through which the nature of Ottoman or Turkish literary modernity was to be conceptualized. In the process, a certain relationship was established between the Persianate as a linguistic and aesthetic category and modes of dangerous, transgressive, or deprecated desire. The fracturing of the Ottoman linguistic interculture, a project of transforming the vast field of Ottoman into an authentic Turkish language and a foreign Persian or Arabic over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was also a process by which affects and desires became queered, designated as foreign pathologies infecting the national sociolinguistic body. Yet this process was never, and indeed could never be, completed. Thus, I'm also interested in the ways that the Persian could function as a site of queer subjectivity and as a space for the articulation of certain aspects of resistance, heteronormative language, and sexual epistemology. And it's in this regard, I think, that I would like to make a small, but I, I think important intervention into the conceptual limits of the Persianate as an analytic category. You know, within contemporary academic literature, on the scope of Persian studies, it's almost invariable that the Tanzimat era of governmental reform, which starts in 1839, is taken as the end point of the Ottoman incorporation into the Persian world. The formulations of the historians Abbas Amanat and Niall Green, who are otherwise quite distinct in their conceptualizations of the Persian and the place of Iran within it, are in essential agreement on this point. The Ottoman Empire was an integral realm of the Persian cosmopolis until the 19th century when French largely replaced Persian as a language of literary cultivation, and Ottoman Turkish came increasingly to be defined as an archaic and elitist register of a living Turkish vernacular, rather than as a medium of cultural production in its own right. The script and language reforms of the early Turkish Republic are taken as the culmination of this process, in which Turkish was finally severed from the Persian and Ecumen, and the nationalist project of engendering a mutual unintelligibility between the two languages became finally and irrevocably complete. From one perspective, I think this is a very justifiable position. For example, Murat Umut Inan's an excellent article on Persian learning in the Ottoman world, included in the 2019 volume, The Persian at World, the Frontiers of a Eurasian Lingua Franca, essentially ends with symbols out of FP, in part because of FP's late 18th century works were the kind of final last major additions to the Ottoman pedagogical canon for Persian within the domain of medrasa education. And yet I wonder whether the emphasis in that volume of deliberately de-emphasizing the notion of Iran, and instead focusing on the material and practical culture of what Niall Green calls personal graphia, in fact occludes the importance of the Persian trace, that is the way in which the symbol and metaphor of Iran and Persian lingered in culture beyond the actual practice of writing and reading what we regard now as Persian language texts. None of the texts I have discussed in this presentation or will discuss later could reasonably be considered works in Persian. Indeed, according to statistical surveys of the Ottoman bureaucracy compiled by Carter Finley, it appears that actual knowledge of Persian writing and reading was in a state of utter collapse, even among the most literate Ottomans during this period. Yet in a sense, it was precisely this estrangement which provided the room for experimentation and reformulation of what Persian, Persian could mean in both negative and positive terms. In this sense, I draw more directly from Hamid Dabashi's notion of persophilia and the way in which tr the travel and transmigration of the notion of Iran, even beyond the reach of the Persian language itself, opened up new space for political definition within the former Persian sphere. And in thinking through the alienation of the Persian language and Persian modes of desire, oh, I think I'm supposed to switch to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, here, yeah, here we have Enderun of Fossil Base, Huban Name, which is actually bound together sometimes with Chef Kengis. And this is just an illustration from another one of Fossil Base works in Anane. Um, so, in thinking through the alienation of the Persian language and Persian modes of desire from the Ottoman interculture, I likewise draw from scholars in the field of Ottoman translation studies, notably Walter Andrews, Victoria Holbrook, and Saliha Paquer. These authors argue uh, or emphasize 
Ottoman literature as an epistemological order unto itself. As Pacher writes, the Ottoman interculture can be characterized as a literary cultural system which had acquired autonomy as a result of its hybridization, in which discourses of style, like Tars, Eded, Seb, Uslup, and so on, uh, an intertextual relation like Tarjame, Nazire, Takli, Talif, Nak played the structural role rather than the notion of distinct autonomous languages as such. In my work, I similarly argue that just as the Ottoman interculture represented a different epistemological order of language, so too did this Ottoman language support a different epistemological order of desire. We might note, for instance, that the categories that are flattened under the heading of sexual desire in most contemporary research were governed in Ottoman by a multiplicity of categories, including Ashk, Dosluk, Perestane, Parelik, and Bazi. And I'm sure that everyone here can kind of understand the rather Persian character of these govern governing terms, All this, though this certainly was not to the exclusion of Arabic-derived vocabulary, which particularly in the medical and legal realm was of equal importance. Yet as Seyf Etin's treatise exemplifies, it was Persian rather than Arabic, that was the primary locus of anxiety in regard to the effects of such terms on Ottoman literature and culture. So in what follows, I would like to discuss two ways in which this anxiety was culturally manifested in the years preceding Seyf Etin's article. In the first place, I want to discuss the writings of an earlier literary reformer, the author Ahmed Mitad Effendi, and the ways in which his social linguistic project fed into Seyf Etin's linkage of the Persianate with the figure of the Char Ebru. Secondly, however, I would like to discuss how this linkage was subverted within the performative genre of Ajem Kantosu, or Iranian cabaret, that proliferated roughly between the period of Ahmed Mitad Effendi's writing and when Seyf Etin sent out his letters to Istanbul. Finally, I'd like to think through how the second strand has continued into contemporary Turkish culture through both the subversion of Ahmed Mitad Effendi and Omar Seyf Etin's value judgments in the writings of the queer encyclopedist Reshad Ekrem Kochu and through the continued usage of Persian vocabulary for obscene, illicit, or semi-illicit modes of desire. So Ahmed Mitzat Effendi uh, is to an even greater degree than Seyf Etin, a kind of paradigmatic figure of the transition from Ottoman to modern Turkish literature. His prolific output, output ranging from dozens of novels and short story compilations to vast quantities of criticism, journalism, philosophical and economic treatises, travelogues, and translations, made him among the first public intellectuals of the Tanzimat era to become wealthy from his literary work. Born and educated in the lower class Istanbul district of Topane, throughout his, oops, go back there. Throughout his career, Ahmed Mithat would emphasize the poverty and destitution of his childhood in promoting his eventual image as a self-made man. In his role as, quote, first teacher then, Ahmed Mithat sought to instill a particular set of moral and social values to the broader public, both literate and non, through his novels, which he largely wrote in the vernacular Turkish of the Istanbulite Esnaf. Indeed, as the literary historian Jalip Harla has noted, Ahmed Mithat's literary and social projects engaged with Ottoman anxieties of increasing European cultural and economic influence by advocating for a new patriarchal order governed by the productive linkage of an Islamic ethos of charity with the entrepreneurial spirit of capitalist development. The subject matters of his novels in this sense had a directly instructive and pedagogical function, as well as an expressly reformist purpose. In large part, this is expressed in the uplift of supposedly fallen women from the Ottoman minorities into domesticity. So the subject of his 1881 novel, Henuz on Yedi Yashinda, is precisely this, and he would reenact this in his own personal life, as well as through the suppression and foreclosure of certain uh, possibilities of Ottoman gendered performance. So in this regard, we might note his condemnation of female Chengi dancers who, quote, would put on men's clothes and draw a mustache on their lips in his 1910 novel, Jeune Turc. Uh, Ahmed Mithat's heteronormative project in this regard was not quite as sharply defined as Seyf Etin's, lacking a consistent historical narrative or linguistic program, but it was a clear precedent to it. And nowhere is this clearer than in his earlier linkage of the Persian language to the eroticism of the young male beloved in his 1882 novel, Durdana Hanum. So even before Durdana Hanum, Iran had appeared as a regular motif in Ahmed Mithat's work. Throughout his writings, the Persian language was associated with an alluring but dangerous sensuality. In the 1875 novel, Pelatumbe Ilir Effendi, for example, the effect of hearing it was literal intoxication. The vernacularized Ottoman Turkish of his popular novels, he publicly argued, served to awaken his readers from the delirium induced by Persian influence. 
Yet, like Omar Say 15, it was the eroticism of the young male beloved that was the primary locus of Ahmed Mithat's literary anxiety. Already early writers had made associations between this eroticism and the influence of Iran in divan literature, exemplified by terms like Charebru, Dilber, Ottoman compound forms like Gulam Pare, Shahid Baz, and Mahbub Dost, and practices like Kurchek cross dressing dance. By 1878, travelogues to Central Asia, like Mehmet Emin Efendi's Istanbuldan Asia Yevusteya Seyahat, first serialized in Ahmed Mithat's newspaper, Terjuman e Hakikat, expressly, explicitly traced practices like Kurchek dance and the seclusion of women to the pernicious, pernicious cultural influence of Iran upon the nomadic Turks in ways directly prefiguring the narrative of Yanili San. For Ahmed Mithat, this eroticism soon became an effect of language and a suppression of his desire equivalent to the banishment of these terms. His subsequent dismissal from Terjiman Hakikat of Mualam Naji, who was his son-in-law, for his use of words like Gulam, Chardabru, Bade, and Saki in poetry is a case in point, as are his later attacks upon the so-called Ottoman decadence for their overly Persianate vocabulary. And so Durdan Hanum kind of represents a summation of these different strands in Ahmed Mithat's thought, particularly through the representation of his protagonist, a young Iranian man in 1880s Istanbul named Ajam Ali Bey. And when we first encounter Ajam Ali Bey in the novel, he's already presented to us as a series of apparent contradictions. He haunts Istanbul's most impoverished and violent districts like Topane and the port of Galata, but is himself chivalrous and a spendthrift of evident social status. He is supposedly Persian in background, but his features are described as Arab and his outfit wholly European. Instead, his Iranian character is evoked mostly through language, through Ahmed Mithat's florid use of Persian of vocabulary, metaphor, and grammar in his description, and through the, quote, light striking at Persian accent in his speech. The ending of the first chapter, however, reveals the most crucial contradiction. For, as Ahmed Mithat explains, quote, the hero called Ajim Ali Bey is really a delicate young girl, Duteri Nazikter, named Ulve Hanum, who has adopted the guise of a young Persian boy, Genj Ajem Puseri, to perform feats of altruism throughout the city. Before this is revealed, however, Ajim Ali Bey is depicted as a fraught object of desire for the inhabitants of the city, and as a faultless male beauty, Mahbub and Mukumel, who recalls the eroticism of Ottoman deep bond literature. And as the novel comes to a resolution, it increasingly kind of disavows this eroticism and its Iranian guise in favor of the emergence of Ulvi Hanum's supposedly authentic self, a transformation that Ahmed Mithat uses to model and prescribe new norms of gender, language, and desire. And so this prescriptive aspect of the text is exemplified most directly in the scenes of Durdana Hanum in which Ajam Ali Bey is presented as a kind of treacherous object of desire for the upright local Cherkes Sobet, who himself was considered, once considered something of a chart of blue, only for this attraction, which has, you know, he is he's continuously kind of framed as uh, dangerous and uh, transgressive, to be sanctioned once he discovers that Ali is actually Ulvi Hanum. Throughout their early encounters in the taverns and coffee houses of Istanbul's port districts, Ahmed Mithat continuously uses their interactions and interplay of looks to model for his readers the difference between moral and immoral desire. Cherkes Sobet, he declares, is not among the immoral ones, Sui Ahlak, who can be hated and shamed for pointing out the beauty of young men. His desirous looks towards Ajam Ali Bey, he writes, are chaste and above all, quote, not comprised of Mahbub Dostluk. A corresponding movement occurs later in the novel, when Aisha Ebe, a woman who has fallen in love with Ajahn Ali Bey and is, is herself dressed in men's clothes, has nevertheless defended as proper. As Ahmed Mithat reminds us, quote, she fell in love believing her a man, not a woman. At the same time, Ajahn Ali Bey is continuously described using the traditional erotic vocabulary of divan literature, and Cherkes Sobet's looks repeatedly threatened to turn transgressive until, overcome with desire when sleeping in the same hotel room, he looks upon Ajahn Ali Bey as he sleeps, and learns that behind this Persian exterior is an Ottoman woman rather than an Iranian chart Ebru. And so these scenes have been understood as reflections of Ahmed Mithat's personal disapproval of homoeroticism. And yet considering the expressly educational and reformist purpose of Ahmed Mithat's popular novels, 
It's surprising that Duridana Hanum has not been read as promulgating and enacting a discourse of nominative and non-normative gendered performance, desire, and terminology, rather than simply re reflecting an existing state of affairs. Indeed, Afamita's own correspondence with Mualam Maji records the struggle to match the conceptual complexity of the Ottoman language relating to desire and the practice of looking to a language of desire more aligned with an emergent heteronormativity. Rather, I read Ajam Ali Bey as a sort of stand-in for the whole subculture of desire and gender performance still evident in the underclass neighborhoods of Istanbul, which Ahmed Mithat's project of social linguistic reform sought to disavow. As the novel remarks early on, social remnants of the abolished Janissary core still present in Galata and Topane, such as the Tulumbaja firefighters, maintained practices like Kurchek dance and open expressions of Mahbub Dosluk, despite their increasingly illicit character. Although formally banned in 1856, for example, as late as 1879, Kurchaks continued to perform illicitly in the taverns and coffee houses of these districts, often working as prostitutes once their performances were complete. Within the musical genre of the street Destan, a form of cheaply printed narrative song distributed by itinerant salesmen, neighborhood residents constructed a kind of counter public, to use Michael Warner's term, in which famous crimes of passion, battles over urban territory, and the qualities of beautiful char de bru and mahboobs were celebrated, and the norms of the incipient Istanbulite bourgeoisie mocked and contravened. As noted by the scholar Nurchin Ileri, Tulumbajas, who constitute 70% of the writers of such destans, regularly describe their male beloveds using terms like mahboob, char de bru, and shaba em red in these works, alongside depictions of scenes of sadomasochism, sexual murder, incest, and all these kind of very transgressive uh, sexual. Uh, practices. So Ahmed Mita's emplacement of Ajim Ali Bey into Gaata and Tokhane, I argue, thus served to map a specifically Persian eroticism and gender ambiguity onto the treacherous urban subcultures of these districts, and constituted a link, a rhetorical link, between the Char Abru, the Kochek, Iran, and the Persian language that would ultimately be taken up by Seyf Yitin and through him into the project of sociolinguistic reform during the early Republic. Uh, Turkish Republic. Yet there was this very assemblage of different markers of alterity that I believe also served to constitute the Persian as a contingent site of kind of queer subversion. So here I want to briefly think through the late Ottoman genre of Ajem Kantosu, or Iranian cabaret, as a kind of subversion of the very set of, same set of associations that produce Ajem Alibe. And indeed, it emerged in the very same theaters and nightclubs that Ajem Alibe is said to have haunted in Durdan and Hanam. It may have actually been the inspiration for the character. Starting roughly around the time of the novel's publication in 1882, young Armenian and Greek actresses resident in Topana and Gaza began to cultivate audiences among resident populations by borrowing freely from deprecated cultural forms like Kochek dance and the hysterical ethnic types of the shadow theater to craft a new syncretistic genre of musical cabaret known as canto. It was most clearly when these actresses took on the persona of an Iranian, that is, in Ajem Kantosu, that the play with gender performance had a characterized Kochek dance and the Zene character from uh, Ortor Yunu improvisational theater was maintained. In the costume of an Iranian youth, actresses like Peruz, who's pictured here, performed as male figures and sang love duets with more feminine coded canto singers. In other Iranian cantos, like those performed by the actress Minyon, uh, Minyon Virgini, the singer performed as a young Persian man in love with her own stage persona. According to some accounts, Istanbul Iranians were particular fans of the genre and were patrons of the performers, and in this sense, the link between Iran and this very local mode of kind of ambiguously gendered performance is actually quite direct. In essence, Ajam Kantasu was a kind of parodic inversion, I argue, of the sort of associations that Alephant Mita Defendi and later Umar Seyfettin would describe to the Persianists. And it was like it was a kind of guise through which various forms of marginalized ethnic, gendered, and erotic identities could be represented in the public sphere. And you know, to a certain extent, this is true of Kanto even in its current form. You know, we might look in this regard to Mignon Virginie's contemporary namesake, Huisur's Virgin, which was a stage persona of the late Seyfi Dursunolu, and Dursunolu's insistence that Huisur's Virgin not be understood as a drag performance, but as a continuation of the Zene tradition, has been criticized for absolving Huisus of political responsibility in the present. But here I would like to argue instead that this was in fact central to actually the 
political nature of the character. You're in an era in which this period, the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid, is routinely characterized in Turkish media as actually fulfilling Ahmed Mithat's vision of a patrimonial capitalist Islamic order, Huysuz Virgin's conflation of the Zene with the Armenian Kantoju, I think speaks to the continued intersection of the queer to minoritarian positions and the continued haunting, haunting of the Persianate into the nation state. And I think even more remarkable is the persistence of Persianate terms related to condemned or semi-licit forms of desire and gender performance in contemporary Turkish as obscenity or slang. And, you know, I won't go through all of them, but, you know, these include common terms like pushed, zampara, kulampara. And, you know, of course, it's hardly unexpected that the process of Republic era language reform did not aim to produce new equivalents or translations to these obscene terms, but this should be compared to how a correspondence proposed by the Ottoman physician Mazar Osman in 1909 between the Persian and Ottoman term Mahbu Perestik and the European sexological term Uranism uh, was replaced during the Republic with the direct translations Uranism and homosexuality and eventually calked into the neologism Eschincel in the 1960s. So instead, what has resulted is actually a kind of dual register of language related to desires and sexual identities, with the Persian as subsisting in slangs, you know, common speech and insults, but sort of largely outside the contemporary textual tradition. And here, though, I should add an important caveat, which is that by emphasizing the multiplicity of Ottoman terms for what has now been kind of remapped according to the epistemology of sexuality, and the continued persistence of this kind of queered Persianate into contemporary language, I do not claim that these are somehow more authentic or local terms or reflect a more deep rooted sensibility. And so there's some current studies of Zene and Kocek performance in contemporary Turkey that characterize these genres as the quote, return of the repressed. And I think this kind of comes too close to arguing that these are more internal or authentic to Turkish culture than other presumably foreign phenomena. And I think in both accounts, arguing this mode to be, would be to reproduce the very logic of national homogenization that kind of fractured Ottoman into its supposed constituent tongues in the first place. So instead here, I follow Evren Savja's recent suggestion that the engagement of critical translation studies with queer studies, and here I would add Persian studies, can move us away from the binary logic of authenticity, modernity, and locality into a broader critique of what she terms homolingualism that is the naturalized correspondence between language and culture. Um, you know, so here I would add that the Ottoman interculture itself and the persistence of the alienated Persianate may also act as a kind of productive site for the critique of such homolingualism. And indeed the Persianate as an assemblage of deprecated affects and modes of desires, I you kind of stands as inherently polyglot. And in this sense that my research also engages with the encyclopedic and erotological projects of Rishat Ekrem Kochu and Hoki Aktunch as archives of this polyglossia, you know, as projects which similarly map the intersections of precarious life, the minoritarian position, and ephemeralities of queer ethics and desires. So as I'm coming to a conclusion, you know, I'd like to return to what the scholar Rustam Artu Altanai has called Rishat Ekrem Kochu's queer archive, that is his monumental, unfinished project, Istanbul Encyclopedia. And in his entry on Ajem Ali Bey, which was published in 1958, Kochu undertook what I consider to be a reparative reading of this otherwise prescriptive character. Recognizing that Ajem Ali Bey was a consummate deployment of the very eroticism that Ahmed Bin Arifendi wished to disavow, Kochu was able to read through Dana Hanum against his intended didactic purpose by liberally editing long quotations from the novel, such that most of Ahmed Bin Tat's moral pronouncements were absent. Instead, the iranophobic anxieties of the novel were recast as matters of taste and aesthetic sensibility, situated within a polyglossic Istanbul in which various modes of desire, beauty, and play could coexist in their epistemic diversity. Kochu ends the entry somewhat ruefully, knowing that Ajam Ali Bey was perhaps, quote, too extreme a type for the era and was thus balanced out by the more conventional ending of the novel. And, and the name of the novel, Cherka uh, Sobet and uh, Ulvia Hanum marry and start a normal kind of family, basically. So, you know, nevertheless, throughout Istanbul Encyclopedia, we are given numerous examples of this type extant, not only in the Ottoman past, but in 1960s Istanbul. As Altanai writes, quote, ignoring the historical paradigm shifts in the norms of gender and sexuality, Kochu suggested some continuity between the perverse performances of his time and Ottoman performance genres that had, to a large extent, already disappeared or gained new meanings. 
And so this linkage of the perverse and the personate that constituted Ajahn Ali Bey could thus be reconstituted, a deprecated figure transformed into a site of critique. So Omar Sayyid died in 1920, only nine years after mailing out his famous questionnaire. And towards the end of his life, he had become engaged in a new project alongside the poet Yahya Kemal and the author Yakub Qadri to sort of reshift the grounds of Turkish culture from Iran towards what they perceived as, uh, as the classicism, rationality, and clarity of the Hellenistic. And so in 1918, for example, Seyfettin produced a sort of idiosyncratic translation of the Iliad. Although he retained a certain attachment to the Istanbulite vernacular Turkish he had praised in any Lisan, this was perhaps a view of Istanbul colored by his life in Salonika and the provinces of the empire. And now, after having actually lived in Istanbul, his search for an authentic Turkish ranged much farther into the past, whether it was the classical or um, the kind of incipient Turanism movement. Um, and yet, even as his ideas would take off and be extended in the subsequent Turkish Republic, his colleague Yahya Kemal appeared to be having certain misgivings. Although Yahya Kemal continued within the political sphere of Kemalism after the war, after the First World War, as a professor, parliamentarian, and diplomat, his post-war poetry came instead to evince a kind of aesthetic return to order, now framed through a strongly Bergsonian conception of time and history, where he had once preached the, pre cre preached the creation of a, quote, white language on classical principles and the removal of Persian influence. His later works were marked by continued engagement with Hafez, Omar Khayyam, and Persian literary forms like the Rubai and Ghazal. In these poems, the Ottoman past, whether through the aesthetic vehicle of an antediluvian tulip era or through the usage of deprecated language, tropes, and product forms, became a means through which the heritage of Iran was claimed once more as the patrimony of Istanbul. And where Seyf Etin had criticized the figure of the Char Ebru as a symptom of the Persian segments that haunted Ottoman literature, Kemal's poems instead imagined a beautiful youth enthralling the city during the time of Nadim. Quote, his accent as if he had come from Shiraz, a nostalgic evocation, he wrote, of the age of Ajahn Parest in the lands of Rome. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric, for this wonderful and very rich presentation. Oh, I'm truly impressed. Wonderful. Uh, so the floor, the virtue floor is open uh, to question. You can, you, know, you can raise your virtual hands in the, according, according to the Zoom function. Okay, Roy. Shoot. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Really, in, uh, really interesting um, stuff and wonderful images. Um, one question that, that imagine, it's, it's the performativity and literary aspect of the, converse, of the, of the talk are, are really fascinating. Um, but may I ask you to say a little bit more about the context within which it operated within increasing national discourses and political change within, I wouldn't say Ottoman society because it's a very particular Istanbuli society, but you know, at the hearts of the Turkish speaking parts of the Ottoman Empire at the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, I can think about this in two ways. I mean, one way would be the sort of changing relationship between Iran and the Ottoman Empire during this time, and in terms of the way that um, as a political project, there was, I think, you know, partially because of the censorship of political topics within, you know, journalism, literary discourse during even during Abdul Aziz, but particularly during the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid, there was a way in which I think political theory and the kind of political project of what the Turkish nation state would look like was framed thus in kind of very aesthetic and literary terms, right? And so for this reason, I think that's why this, you know, notion of Persianism and this notion of, you know, what the Persian influence within Turkish culture actually represented. Um, maybe in a way became such an important topic, right? It was because it was a way of framing what the political content of the future kind of Turkish state would be 
in a way that wasn't actually directly political, right, or explicitly political. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the relationship between the Ottoman Empire and Iran, you know, we see, on one hand, there's a kind of normalization of relations, right, because we have now in the 19th century treaties that recognize, for example, Iranians as foreign citizens now in the Ottoman Empire, right, rather than before they were considered just generically under the category of Muslim in the Ottoman uh, system. Um, but with that, I think, came both a kind of uh, certain exoticism and a um, certain sort of kind of alienation also, right? So um, it's interesting that, for example, during this period, it's during the late 19th century that the performance of, of Muharram, you know, Ashura, really, you know, became a very, very public spectacle in Istanbul, right? Um, because now it was actually kind of permitted to kind of go ahead um, from the kind of center of the Iranian community in uh, Fatih and kind of actually perform this long procession. Um, but what you see is that as that actually becomes more and more public um, within Turkish literature, within the journalist community, within, um, you know, I, you know in, in terms of just you know, popular culture, it becomes a very kind of a sign of something very alien and very foreign about Iran and about Shiism and about kind of this different mentality, right? And so, you know, by the late 19th century, you know, Ashura in Istanbul has become a kind of tourist attraction for, you know, Turkish Istanbulites to go and watch this kind of exotic performance. Um, there's a very funny uh, line by Ubeydullah Fendi, who was a kind of traveler who went to uh, Iran during the First World War. And he traveled to both the United States and Iran. And he said that United States is a land of material weirdness and Iran is a land of cultural weirdness, right? So it's a very kind of interesting, like, um, way in which, you know, that kind of Persian commensurability, which I think existed before, became something very incommensurable and became very kind of a, a kind of hard cultural line between uh, kind of this notion of an, a Turkish culture and the exoticized Iran. More questions? Uh, well, allow me to abuse my role then. Uh, and ask you, uh, so I mean, and forgive my ignorance, but uh, uh, so you uh, brought in that image, which was a translation of Van Bery's uh, Travel to Central Asia. But Van Bery also has a number of passages about this, uh, those abhorrent sexual practices that he uh, allegedly saw in, 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 in Hiva. Um, so I was wondering, uh, but Bambery was, you know, he, 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 was, he was very much sort of sensitive to the expectations of the Victorian uh, sort of British uh, public. So I was wondering uh, what's your take on, you know, the perhaps, you know, an influence of Victorianism on sort of concepts of heteronormativity, et cetera. I know that there is a lot of literature about that, so forgive my influence. I mean, my, probably my reading stopped with, stopped probably with uh, R.Y. Hebb's uh, book on, on the, the birth of homoeroticism or something like that. So I was wondering what, 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 what you see, how, how you sort of understand uh, the concept of, or sort of the influence of Victorianism. Uh, the other thing that I was um, wondering about is that you sort of use, and, and I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you are very sort of conscious about this, of, of that, but, but in any way, so you, you use uh, Persianate and Iranian sort of interchangeably. Uh, is it a function of your sources or, so how, how do you do that? Because um, obviously that there must have been sort of an, an uh, you know sort of a, a monolingualization of of the understanding of of nations uh, in the nineteenth century, right? Uh, so Iran coming to be uh, sort of associated with Persian, 
Although uh, it's obvious that in, a, in the 17th and 18th century context, it wouldn't have been the case, right? So um, Sapke Hindi being a case in point. Uh, but my third question, so this is, so, so Ajem and Iran, right? So the, the question, um, the second, the third question that I, I would have is, is, is you kind of, I was fascinated by, you know, your references to the uh, 19th century celebrations of the Muharram. Um, so I was wondering how, uh, if you see also traces of sort of previous uh, religious antagonists continuing into this, uh, these sort of uh, antagonists again, you know, these sort of ill feelings or, or sort of this, uh, uh, I can't find the right word, but anyway, so so this critique of the use of of, of, of Persian uh, vocabulary, right? Uh, I have a fourth question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just wondering. I mean, do you also? I mean, uh, so so you had uh, you had uh, you had uh, you, you referred to sort of you know heter you know non heteronormative phrases, kind of being associated particularly with. Uh, uh, um, with Persian, but I was wondering, there must have been other, I mean, um, I mean, there are other such sources for vocabulary, I guess, Iran, um, Armenian must have must have also been like, I think, Khovarda, it must be in, I, I think it's in Iran, in Armenian uh, loan word. So, I mean, do, do you see other such minorities as sort of sources for, uh, you know, non-sexual normative uh, uh, vocabulary? <laughs> great. Thank you so much. These are great questions. Um, I guess I'll, I'll work backwards. So um, in regard to the first question, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, definitely uh, Armenian, Greek, Roma languages particularly became really sources of, or, or remain, remain sources of, you know, this kind of language for, um, yeah, illicit sexualities or kind of obscene desires or things like that, right? It's definitely... I mean, it's interesting in that sense that the, you know, more Persian-derived words kind of coexist, I think, with Armenian-derived terms, uh, you know, Greek-derived terms. Um, and one of, you know, the project that I reference, Hulki Aktunch's um, Argos Uzlu, is, you know, precisely kind of trying to trace all these kind of, um, you, know, you know, these terms that seem to be coming out of both minority languages and coming from you know, uh, words from Arabic and Persian that were not kind of uh, lost or translated in the process of language reform, but survived in that kind of lower register. Um, in regards to, or is that the next one? Sure, but, but so what I was driving at is the politics of all that, right? right? So I mean, is, it Persian, is Persian sort of such a sort of a special source of vocabulary or, 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 or do you see parallels with other, uh, minority languages or minority yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the the main difference from Persian would be that it was, again, kind of part of the Ottoman corpus in a way that was a little bit different from, for example, Armenian or Greek, right? So I think I, I think that kind of intersection which we see in Ajem Kantosu of an Armenian actress performing as Iranian and doing this kind of thing actually kind of is a kind of, you know, I don't want to say it's a manifestation, but it's a kind of interesting parallel to the way in which, yeah, Armenian terms and Persian terms seem to kind of exist on that level um, in contemporary Turkish. Um, in regards to the religious aspect and the sectarian aspect, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, to give an example, uh, Ahmed Mithat, um, well, often Mithat Effendi traveled with Mithat Pasha to Baghdad, and that's where he kind of became the sort of, uh, he did kind of developed as a sort of intellectual figure as a kind of attache in Baghdad. Um, you know, and what we see is that, you know, a lot of the kind of theorists of, um, you know, Ottoman social reform, Ottoman historical uh, writing, you know, um, like, Afemitad Efendi, like Osman Hamdi Bey, were actually kind of in Baghdad at that point in time. And when we read, like, for example, their letters or their correspondence, you know, the question of 
Shiism as this kind of Iranian, you know, this kind of vector for Iranian influence is actually very, very present, right? It's very evident. Um, and I think Oswan Hamdi Bey has a very interesting section where he talks about, you know, sort of in a similar way that, you know, like uh, there is this kind of, um, you know, aspect of the foreign that is kind of working its way inside the Ottoman state through this kind of, um, through the, the kind of influx of Shiism through Iraq and through different places. Um, so yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when it comes to like Seyfettin, the, the sectarian aspect is definitely downplayed in terms of, uh, in his frame more in terms of, you know, aspects like culture and, you know, kind of notions of yeah nomadism versus civilization and things um but i think in the earlier period and you know particularly around the 1860s 1870s that more sectarian aspect was really present um and really uh interplayed with what later developed um i think was the victorian one next uh (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that I think is important to remember is that, like, it was not the case, for example, that there was a kind of uh, progression of heteronormativity, right, in the sense that, like, London or New York or whatever becomes fully heteronormative and then Istanbul fo- follows, right? I mean, because maybe because I'm more in the kind of like uh, Foucauldian, you know, <laughs> tradition, you know, I mean, for me, I think what we see is actually kind of simultaneous process. Which is structural. So these, these are, there are structural reasons for that. I, I think it is structural. I don't think it's, it's purely in the realm of culture, but it is expressed in different ways according to the cultural content that exists, right? So um, yeah, in the Ottoman case, for whatever reason that is in place upon Persian. But I don't think that by itself, that's necessarily structurally different from the same kind of, you know, sort of interior civilizing mission that you see among Victorian reformers in the slums of London, right? Or, you know, reformers in Paris at that time. So um, yeah, for sure. I, I think it's actually very, very connected. And it's about a kind of system of, um, yeah, of, of of a of a structure of um, trying to account for maybe class difference in this new kind of moral, sexual kind of way, if that makes sense. Um, and I think you had one more question, which I'm forgetting right now. So, Ajem and you know, oh, Ajem yeah. and, and Iran and India, perhaps. And, so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's where that process is really coming in because, I, you know, in the 18th and early 19th centuries as well, I, there's definitely, I think, no necessary, you know, uh, correspondence between, you know, uh, Ajem and, and Persian itself, right? I mean, Farsi or Ajem, right? Like, um, and, and you know, in this regard, I mean, for example, the um, the language of Ajem Kantosu is a kind of a mix of sort of Azeri, Turkish, and Persian, right? So sometimes it's more Azeri, and sometimes it's more directly Persian. Um, so in that sense, you know, the notion of Ajem is more is broader than just what we would consider in the national terms to be the Persian language itself today, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's also because a little bit later, but a kind of simultaneous process was occurring within Lake Qajar and Pahlavi Iran. Because of that, it, you end up with, by the end of it, um, yeah, a very kind of distinct notion of Turkish as a, you know, language of Turkey and Persian as a language of Iran to the exclusion of languages which seem to be in the kind of middle, like Azari, right? Um, so, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this is where you kind of trace that that process by which Persian becomes kind of localized in this geography of Iran. 
Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further questions uh, from my learned colleagues? If we have time, I'll just uh, sneak in a, a small question slash observation, especially with regard to Ajami or Ajam Chair, like the language of the, um, that's quite interesting because given the period that I'm looking at, which is more early modern, in the kind of oral uh, storytelling, performative almost storytelling of Korkuk Dede, which is uh, kind of a, the mythos of um, the Turkmen on the Iranian plateau and beyond. Ajam has no connotation with uh, Persian language um, at all. Like uh, Chuke said, it's, it's very much a modern kind of uh, association that is being made between if it's Ajam, then it must be somehow Persian or persian -us because the hero, the Turkmen hero of Korkut Dede also describes himself in terms of not just Turkmen lineage, but he calls himself Ajam Olu, son of Ajam or Ajam born. So that was uh, very interesting for me to see the transition that is being made. There are still ways in which this turko tajik world is being made sense of, but it's increasingly one people being associated with one language, being kind of placed in a certain geographic territory along national um, lines. I would like to actually follow up on Churke's uh, question with regard to different languages being kind of assigned different roles in this kind of literature that she talks about. And I'm in particular interested about uh, Arabic because Arabic in the period that I study is very much a hallowed language. It's a sacrosanct language. How is that kind of repurposed in the literature? Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, actually, let me talk a little bit about your first point and then I'll talk about the second point. So um, in terms of, you know, the way in which, um, yeah, like the category of Ajem becomes nationalized and ethnicized, right, during the 19th century. You see this also, um, very clearly in the way that Iran and Turan become ethnicized, right? Um, you know, there's a way in which obviously there are always kind of associations made, but there was, I don't think, a kind of necessary attribution, for example, of Iran to just Persian language speakers and Turan to Central Asian Turkish speakers, like our Turkic speakers. Um, and what's very interesting is that when Turanism as a kind of philosophical, political, linguistic concept in the late Ottoman Empire and early Turkish Republic kind of tries to formulate itself, you know, they have a real dilemma in the sense that Turan appears kind of dependent, A, upon the Shahnameh tradition, right, and B, upon, again, a notion of Iran as this kind of counterpoint. And so what is the independent existence of Turan as a civilization? And so, you know, you read uh, Zia Gokalp, you know, for instance, who is kind of the ideologue of Turanism at some point. And, you know, he, he says very explicitly, like, I, I, yes, there are people who say, you know, Turanism or Turan comes from the Shahnameh, therefore it's not even Turkish at all. But, you know, through the practice of Turkology and through anthropology and through archaeology, we can assert a kind of authenticity to Turan, which is not dependent upon the Persian literary tradition. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's very interesting the process by which these categories, which you know, really are, you know, social, sometimes poetic categories, become instead very defined in terms of ethnos, right? Um, and in regard to your second question, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting because in a very generic way, a lot of literary reformers during this period will say, you know, Arabi, La Farsi, right? Um, but they, or Arabcha, Farsha, but they don't really, in a kind of 
literary sense actually focus on Arabic that much, right? Like it's a kind of set construction to refer to these foreign elements in Ottoman. But when you read most of these writers, Arabic kind of is not really the main topic of concern until the Republic. For me, what that signifies is that the shift to secularity actually is very important in the way that Arabic is um, then kind of lumped in with Persian as a problematic aspect. I mean, there's different ways you can also frame that. You can frame that in terms of the Ottoman Empire is, you know, still, uh, you know, geographically mostly a you know Arabic-speaking empire until 1918, right? Um, and but but I think really when you look at the way in which what is the central problematic um really up until the, the the declaration of you know state secularism and the declaration of the republic as the you know the the the, the nation forming a kind of foundational principle of the state um it's really at that point that arabic becomes a bigger problematic than persian and i think um you know for that reason um that that's why we kind of have that shift that takes place um and it's also perhaps a reason i mean not necessarily because the amount of persian that or persian vocabulary in ottoman was i think always less than the amount of arabic vocabulary um but i think that's perhaps the reason why the excision of persian terms was I think probably more completed than the removal of Arabic derived terms um, during the language forms of the Republic. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, I, I would have further questions along <laughs> to follow this up, but uh, I think we it, it's high time that we uh, moved on. Thank you very much indeed again, Eric, for this wonderful talk and the very insightful answers as well. So Thank you. Uh, Muhammad Amer, Dr. Muhammad Merhab of the University of Groningen uh, uh, is our next speaker who uh, is going to talk about languages of pre-modern Islamic political thought. Thank you. Thank you. I just tried to share my slides. Uh. some reason okay let's see uh well, i'm just yeah yeah yeah, no, yeah. okay it work now yeah. okay okay i hope it's working now perfect okay so hello everyone uh, uh thank you friends thank you amir parsa for inviting me to to this uh, workshop it's great to be back although virtually at SOAS, to see friends from SOAS. Um, where uh, here, I mean, at SOAS, I, I got my PhD and my, and my MA. And in the interest of time, I, I'll start immediately. And um, basically the symbiosis of Turkic, Arabic, and Persian cultures across uh, the me medieval and, and early modern Islamic world, uh, which the present workshop is interested with, is very visible especially in the field of the history of pre-modern Islamic political thought. And my talk today will discuss the difference between languages in the abstract sense, that is Arabic, Persian, uh, uh, or, or Turkish, and political languages of Islam or the languages of Islamic political thought in pre-modern Islamic societies. And basically the, the argument I'll try to make is that using both interchangeably is basically a distortion of the cultural, social, political um, mesh of pre-modern Islamic political, so, uh, uh, sorry, societies. And to start, uh, this, yeah, so basically this is uh, the essence of my talk today. The starting point of, of my talk is a treatise uh, titled Nisbah al-Hidayah fi Tariq al-Imama, or The Guiding Lamp uh, to the Path of the Imama. It's a Sufi political thought treatise uh, which was dedicated by an unknown author to the Mamluk Sultan, most likely to the Mamluk Sultan, Adahir Baybars. Uh, 
And basically, Misbah al-Hidayah, or the guiding lamp, was a distinctly Sufi strain of political thought in the 13th century or during the early Mamluk period. It was presented by its anonymous author, to, most likely to Baybarswan, as a uniquely Sufi conception of the imamate and the ideal of the rule of law. So this misbah is this Mamluk Sufi attempt to conceptualize political authority and make case for the rule of law in a distinctly Sufi fashion. It was authored at, at, a, at a point in Islamic history when Sufi thought was burgeoning in the central, eastern, and western parts of the Islamic world. And I avoid using Arabic speaking or, or Persian speaking or Turkic speaking part of the Islamic world because uh, many of you know that is way more complicated than that. And the disciples of great Sufi figures like Najmuddin Kubra, Suhrawardi, Ibn Arabi, Abu Hassan Shadili, Jalal al-Din Rumi, and Ahmad al-Badawi spread throughout the Islamic world and permeated all social groups. As such, the Misbah, this distinctly Sufi work, was the manifestation of a political context that encouraged the production of political thought and similarly the result of a Sufi intellectual context that witnessed great advances in speculative Sufism. And it was in 1995 that Professor Wilfred Madelung brought Misbah al-Hidayah to light. Yet the Misbah did not simply have a Sufi outlook as Professor Madelung suggested, but it was expressed in a distinctly Sufi way. The author did not compose the Misbah as a political work merely influenced by Sufism, but rather as a Sufi treatise that treated distinctly Sufi political ideals, political thought, and he presented it as such to his dedicatee and intended audience. The Misbah was a Sufi work whose content relied on Sufi texts, and we will discuss that, on Sufi languages and Sufi concepts. Most importantly, the author, the anonymous author of the Misbah, strived to present it as a purely and distinctly Sufi work and desired it to be read as such. So there is a need to examine uh, the Misbah and play, most importantly, place the anonymous author within his ideological, intellectual, and social scholarly context. And his attempt to present Sufism as a third alternative to to uh, Ash'arism and Mu'tazilism, the author revealed two valuable clues, one on his sources and the other on his political theory. The first, related, uh, the first clue related to his sources and his agency in using them. And the author I noticed used, of course, Al-Mawardi's Adab al-Dunya wal Deen, the ethics of the world uh, and religion, on whether to rely on reason or revelation, known discourse, aql or shara, in justifying the requirement for an imam. The author of the Misbah skillfully modified Al-Mawardi's uh, discussion and integrated Sufism into it. And clearly this was not a case of someone simply uh, repeating or collating earlier discussions or text, but a rather highly erudite and able scholar who was capable of selecting, rearranging, modifying, and employing earlier political discussions and texts to suit his own purposes, his own political thought, basically. As for the clue concerning his political theory, the author of the Misbah revealed that his distinctly Sufi treatise legitimated the forceful seizure of the Sultanate, no surprise here, of course. Likewise, the author of the Misbah advocated the requirement and legitimacy of coercive authority by working out a meticulous a synthesis of the stipulation for the imamate of al juwaini and Al-Ghazali, especially Riyat al-Umam, or Aid to Nations Shrouded in Darkness, a uh, very important Shafi'i text, uh, 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 and Al-Ghazali's Mustazhiri, or the scandals of the esoterics and the virtues of the party al uh, of the Caliph Al-Mustazhir. Um, and in uphold, as I mentioned, in order to uphold the concern for the rule of law, he relied on other carefully selected texts, including Al-Mawardi's Adab al-Dunya Wadni. But some, something was still missing. Um, there were several conceptual clues that the Misbah greatly benefited from Al-Suhrawardi and especially Ibn Arabi. And this made perfect sense. I, I, I keep on coming back. This is idea of, of the intellectual uh, network within which the author flourished. 
This made perfect sense. The anonymous author was clearly trained in the same ideological tradition and scholarly milieu. He was a Sufi, a Nash'ari, and in all likeliness, a Shafi'i scholar. Yet I couldn't establish a direct link to Ibn Arabi. And then I thought that it could be that Ibn Arabi's influence on the Misbah came through a non-Arabic text. So I enlisted the help of a colleague who was familiar with medieval Persian literature, but they couldn't identify this influence. And as a last resort, we both translated long passages of the Misbah to English as a very basic way of doing it. And we started searching Turkish and Persian texts in English translation, but only texts that were clearly linked to Ibn Arabi Sufism. And after a while, uh, the mystery was solved and we identified that the Misbah was influenced by a Persian text, Mirsad uh, al-Ibad min al-Mabda il al-Ma'ad, or the path of God's bondsman from origin to return, a near contemporary compendium of Sufism that was authored by a renowned uh, uh, Sufi scholar, Najmuddin Daya Razi, in the 13th century, the known Ash'ari Sufi thinker. And the pieces of the puzzle started to fall into place. The author of the Misbah, in fact, used this text to highlight the rule of law in another distinctly Sufi manner. And we're talking about near contemporary text, of course. Well, I mean, uh, clearly this text reached him within a short period. To achieve this end, the, the anonymous author resorted to the Mirsad and other texts in order to articulate a Sufi theory of moderation of the exercise of power by the coercive Sultan. Now the Mirsad was a heavily influenced uh, text by Ibn Arabi and Suhra Wardi, and was a founding text that explained the Sufi doctrine, summarized its elaboration, and demonstrated the Islamic roots of Sufism. Most importantly, the Mirsad included an important contribution to Islamic political thought in a distinct, distinctly Sufi terminologies, most notably in the fifth part, where Razi discussed the conduct of the ruler, vizier, judges, and other professions. Um, the largest section of the Misbah was heavily influenced by this, uh, by this Ash'ari Sufi text, by, by Razi's text. From the beginning to the end, the essay of, the es of this essay of this chapter, the author used rearranged passages from Razi's Mirsad in, in a really impressive, systematic, and purposeful manner. The near verbatim use of the Mirsad can be spotted, in fact, can be spotted, in fact, at the start of the Mirsad, uh, of the second chapter of, of the Misbah, where the author described Imam al-Din. Uh, and in the first chapter of the fifth part of the Persian Mirsad, titled Concern, Concerning the Wayfaring of Kings and the Lords of Command, uh, it related that there are two classes of kings, kings of the world and kings of the religion. Of course, this is a translation for Imam al-Din and Imam al-Dunya. As for those who are the kings of the religion, it said they have opened the supreme talisman of form with the key of the law, that's Sharia, held in the hand of the path, the tariqa, with the eye of the truth, the haqiqat. They have contemplated the states and attributes stored and hidden in the depth of their being, like buried treasure and gems. They have penetrated to the mystery of the treasure of he who knows his self, knows to his law. This was verbatim how the Arabic Misbah described Imam al-Din in Arabic based on the Persian Mirsad. And I have to say this is a beautiful text, whether in Arabic, Persian, or in English translation. And the author of the Misbah succeeded in presenting this coherent Sufi political theory to the Mamluk Sultan Baybars, most likely to the Mamluk Sultan Baybars. The author expressed his distinctly Sufi theory of legitimate, coercive, and just sultanate based on four tenets. The first was the conception of the highest political authority that was in harmony with the coercive sultanate as argued for by Mawardi, Juwaini, and Ghazali. The author of the Misbah achieved this first aim, as I mentioned, based on a shrewd synthesis of these texts and the, these Arabic texts. The second tenet was upholding the rule of law, which the author expressed in a Sufi language that was rooted in the Arabic works of Al-Mawardi and the Persian texts of Dayai Razi, and through a mystical and Islamized system of ethics that included the Sufi conception of the philosopher king. 
The third tenet of the Misbah was that its author succeeded in presenting a distinctly Sufi theory. So although the Misbah was deeply rooted in Sufi Ash'ari and, and Shafi'i uh, thought, the author still succeeded in making, making it distinctly Sufi through a careful, careful, artful reworking of the Arabic Adab dunya and the Persian Mirsad. The fourth tenet, of course, which is perhaps not of concern to us today, was that the Misbah tried to accommodate the concerns of, of its dedicatee, Sultan Baybars. Now, this is where it gets interesting for our uh, uh, workshop, is that the Mirsad was translated from Persian to English, and the translation appeared in 1982. But the translation of the, the translator of the Mirsad denied that it had any influence on the central and Afri I'm quoting the translator, on the central and African Islamic regions, that is the Arabic speaking world which is a rather surprising assumption, because when we work on a text, in fact, we strive to, to, to prove that it was influential outside uh, its, its uh, known circulation. The editor and translator knew very well, though, that Razi wrote in both Arabic and Persian, and that Razi himself became a Sufi in Egypt. In his own words, Razi's interest in Sufism was awakened in Egypt where he became a murid of Shaykh Rizbihan al-Wazan al-Masri, who had been initiated to the Suhrawardi line. Moreover, Razi also wrote in Arabic. He authored a renowned text, Manarat Sa'irin wa Maqamat al-Ta'irin Billah, Light Towers for Those Voyaging to God and the Stations of Those Flying with God, which is another founding Sufi text with important political ideas. So please allow me to, to summarize again. So Wilfred Madelung missed the heavy influence of the Persian Mirsad on the Arabic Misbah. Furthermore, the Mirsad was translated from Persian to English in 1982, but the translator of the Mirsad denied that it had any influence on Arabic texts. Yet Razi also wrote in Arabic, as I mentioned, Manarat al-Sa'irin, uh, which a very important text with important political ideas, and it appeared in 1993 in an Arabic edition. The translator of the Mirsad into English and following him, Professor Anne Lampton at SOAS at the time, mistook the Manarat for an Arabic translation of the Mirsad. To add to this series of colossal errors, an Arabic translation of the Mirsad appeared in 2002, which was completely unaware of the Arabic Musbah and earlier Arabic translations of the Mirsad. And it's appeared as falsafa tasawwuf wa da'wa ilallah. Remarkably, it was not until 2017 that Hussein Yilmaz, a historian of the Ottoman Empire, noted that the importance of the Mirsad as a founding text uh, that was popular from Cairo to China in his seminal work, Caliphate Redefined. So it was an, a historian of, of the Ottoman Empire that spotted the influence of this, of this Persian text. And of course, in 2022, uh, I noted the influence of the Persian Mirsad on the Arabic Misbah. And I'm afraid that this, this mess really is rooted in a serious impediment in the fields of, of, of the history of, well, in the field of Islamic history, Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies, and Central Asian studies. And I will only focus on uh, the part related to the history of Islamic political thought in, in, in what follows. And I call this impediment the mythology of, of genre, uh, especially in the history of Islamic political thought. And the idea is that some scholars contend that the genre of a political text is fixed in both content and style, and therefore dictates the postulated political ideas within the text. Furthermore, the genre is occasionally reconstructed along fictional dichotomies, especially between Arabic and Persian, and in Arabic and Persian texts, and an elusive and highly problematic pursuit of, of cultural continuity in political ideas. The scheme such scholars propose is simple. Islamic political thought produced by jurists only treated religion and the so-called theory of the caliphate, while the literati broadly defined as non-jurists were interested in the themes of kingship, the sultanate, the arts of statecraft and administration, and ancient conceptions of justice. And relentless attempts by scholarship aim to uphold fixed and continuous genres, especially 
mirrors for princes. The fixation somehow transformed the discourse on medieval Islamic political thought to one of genre as opposed to one of conceptions of political authority and governance. And Lambton, for example, delimited three main formulations of political thought, the theory of the jurists, theory of the philosophers, and literary theory. In this once widely accepted and still resonant scheme, literary theory is understood to include the genres of mirrors for princes and administrative manuals. Lampton's categor categorization assumed that the first formulation, and I'm quoting Anne Lampton, was the most truly Islamic of the three. The third formulation, on the other hand, is concerned with the practice rather than the theory of government and seeks some measure to assimilate Islamic norms to Sasanian traditions of kingship. Its basis is justice rather than right religion or knowledge. And so unchanging and blurred was this categorization that with time, uh, it became almost sufficient for some scholars to recognize the genre of a political text in order to presume the postulated political theory or the theory in general. It even became possible for some to claim that language in the abstract sense, that is Arabic, Persian, or Turkish, dictated the political language of a treatise. As such, Arabic, Persian, or Turkish treatises upheld different political ideals. And post-classical texts, uh, so after the ninth century up to the 15th, 14th, do not fit well with this categorization. In addition of the previously discussed Mersad, which is a great proof of, uh, to refute this, this uh, approach, I'll present very briefly two more cases where complications arose from assuming that the genre determines the content of a political text. And the first one is uh, Bahr al-Fawaid, uh, the known mirror titled Bahr al-Fawaid, the Sea of Precious Virtues, which was composed in mid-12th century Syria. It's a Persian text composed in Syria, and the anonymous uh, Persian work counters any suggestion that the mirrors, mirrors for princes genre was any less an Islamic formulation of political thought than that of treatises written by jurists. There is nothing in this mirror that supports the stigma of being less Islamic, which Lambton had associated with this genre. This treatise reflects in an unembellished Shafi'i, Ash'ari, and Sufi tone, an Islamic conception of justice and a clear influence, very clear in fact, of Al-Ghazali. Bahr al-Fawaid contradicts the idea that the genre itself dictates the political content of mirrors for princes. Moreover, it was deeply rooted in the Arabic tradition of authoring advice literature. In 2001, Professor Khirtian van Gelder a uh, Dutch scholar uh, who was working at Oxford at the time, noted the influence on the Bahr al-Fawaid of an Arabic word, work titled Mufid al-Ulum wa Mufid al-Humum, authored in 1156. And the second and final case I, I want to present is uh, more known, of course, is Kitab Nasihat al-Muluk, or Book of Counsel for Kings, which is a mirror attributed wrongly to, to Ghazali. As Patricia Krone established in 1987. This work was in two parts, the anonymous mirror, Nasihat al-Muluk, and the Risala, the epistle, which may have been, according to Krone, Krone al-Ghazali's or, or based on his writings. Now, both parts were available in Arabic and Persian. The, ca the cataloger of, of the Damascene Ashrafiya Library, and this is a 13th century library, where we have the index of this library and Professor Konrad Herschler worked extensively on this index. The cataloger of, of this library, again in the 13th century, uh, noted next to it uh, suspiciously, next to these titles on, on the index, Fihi Nazar, thus counting doubt on the attribution of these texts to Al-Ghazali. So we're talking about an index in the 13th century. And most likely, these texts were available in both Arabic and Persian in the Damascene library. Um, so basically, he, he cast a doubt on, on whether the Council for Kings or the Risalat al-Ghazali, al-Ghazali's epistle, uh, were really uh, authored by al-Ghazali. And then again, in 1924, Zaki Mubarak, who worked on, on, on al-Ghazali's works, 
noted that the book was weak in the treatment of several topics, I'm quoting Zaki Mubarak, and consequently unlike Al-Ghazali. In 1938, with the first Persian edition of Nasihat al-Muluk, uh, the editor Humayi fiercely defended the authenticity of the work, but later in the second edition in 1972, he accepted that it was a part of this work that was uncharacteristic of Ghazali. So it took over 60 years to recognize the concern that has been voiced in 1924, and in fact seemed rather obvious to an average medieval scholar like the Damascene catalog. And this, there's a simple explanation for this, for this confusion and for, for these continuing confusions, is that scholars considered Nasihat al-Muluk to be a fixed Persian mirror for princes, rather than a work that comprised political conceptions that could not have been expressed by al-Ghazali. Examining this mirror as a work of Islamic political thought would have led the same scholar to different conclusions. The attribution of this text to a Nash'ari or Shafi'i Sufi thinker ought to have immediately alarmed a historian of Islamic political thought. In 2000, and by the way, this is the, if, if you're interested in the catalog of, of uh, the Ashrafiya library, you can look at Konrad Herschler's uh, book, Plurality and Diversity in Arabic Library, and see how people read in several languages, in fact. In 2008, and again in 2015, Alexi Kismutalin confirmed beyond any doubt the forgery of Nizam al-Mulk's Siyar al-Muluk, the Siyasat Nameh, and parts of Ghazali's Nasihat al-Muluk. In fact, he even succeeded in unmasking the identity of the potential counterfeiter. Yet, people ignore these findings, and subsequent studies still insist on ascribing Nasihat al-Muluk to Ghazali and Siyar al-Muluk or Siyasat Nameh to Nizam al-Muluk. And in fact, basing major arguments on, and conclusions on this false attribution. This includes a book, uh, uh, Advice for the Sultan, Prophetic Voices and Secular Politics in Medieval Islam, published by Oxford in 2014, and another book um, published anyway in 2015. Um, so to conclude, basically, so this is the idea I'm trying to convey to today. There are scholarly studies and general readership works that refer interchangeably to languages in the abstract sense, that is Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, and political languages of pre-modern Islamic texts. These views are utter distortions of the pre-modern Islamic world, of the social, religious, cultural networks that existed and within which authors of Islamic political thought flourished and, 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 and operated. And the, this, this is best left for study under the purview of modernists specialized in the history of nationalism. Pre-modern Islamic author, authors displayed an astonishing agency in benefiting from their influences to suit their own aims in writing political texts. They had mastered the delicate art of including, excluding, rearranging, and altering passages from earlier writings that they borrowed from and most importantly, adding to them to express their own political thought and their own political concerns and idea that dealt with their own time. And as, as I hope I already demonstrated, it mattered little if these influences were Arabic, Persian, Turkish, or Syriac or Greek. These, these authors communicated their thought using specific political languages that were intended to be understood as languages, as political languages by their audiences dedicatees and interlocutors based on prevailing conventions of, at the time. And understanding this authorial agency is the key to retrieving the political languages of medieval Islamic societies, not languages in the abstract sense. So languages in the abstract sense, Arabic, Persian, or Turkish uh, should not be confused with the political languages of Islam or some, as some scholars say, or the political languages of pre-modern Islamic political thought. What matters most, most is understanding the ideological, scholarly, and social networks of these authors. We've seen how, how Razi, for example, uh, Sufi network ranged from, from Egypt and North Africa into Central Asia, and how this network translated and used and adapted ideas uh, in order to convey their own political ideas. 
And, and to understand this, these languages, we should be aware of the conventions. And I'm here using, of course, uh, the work of Quinton Skinner's and others. We should understand the conventions of the prevalent discourses at the time. And the idea of an idiom where, which, where the meaning is, is only understood by those who are familiar with, with these conventions is central to understanding these political languages of, of pre-modern Islamic political thought. Languages in the abstract sense, in the case of, of the history of uh, pre-modern Islamic so, uh, political thought, are, I argue, irrelevant. And this is basically the idea I wanted to communicate. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Marhab, uh, for this very interesting and the provocative uh, talk. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll, I'll stop sharing my slides. So, questions from the audience would be welcome. Roy. Yeah, thanks, Muhammad. It's terrific, really, really interesting and very intriguing. Um, May I introduce maybe a larger question to on top of, of whatever you were saying that I was a bit curious about. And that you mentioned Hussein Ilmaz uh, and his work uh, Caliphate redefined it. One of the points that really interesting and very important point I think that he's making there is by taking the caliphate and show how a term that has a whole set of connotations, understanding and political significance being, let's say, remolded to introduce, to, to introduce new or additional concepts of messianism or, or this kind of millenarian or millennial moment of, of the 16th century in the Ottoman context. And, and, and I thought about how this kind of frame of taking existing language and deliberately changing it using different traditions to meet this, um, th this kind of, let's say, temporal needs, how, how can this correspond with your theory here or your, your understanding here? And in particular, when we have the layer of prestige and different levels of prestige of those three languages. Now, I, 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 I'm quite convinced by, you, by, by what you were saying. I, I'm just trying to, 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 to think how this element of this special position of Arabic, for example, within all this, that you need this stamp of Arabic to make something legitimate in a certain way or usable. So how do you think we can maybe use these kind of yeah. understandings? The, 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 the nice thing of the Ottoman case is that um, it provides a very visible way of, of juggling with the three languages uh, by, by some of these authors, Sufi-minded authors, that Yilmaz and others worked on to show that uh, basically they, they picked and choose from whatever uh, text or tradition was needed to legitimate the rulers or to, to pr uh, propose their own ideas. And in fact, it is exactly the same in the Mamluk tradition, in the early Mamluk tradition, the late Ayyubid tradition, where people adapted these ideas, um, used texts that were focused on, on the caliphate of Baghdad, removed any mention to the caliph, to the, uh, to the caliph and used it for a Mamluk Sultan. Um, whether the Turk uh, text was Greek, a lot of use of Greek text, Syriac text, uh, Persian texts, uh, Turkish notions of legitimations are used in Arabic texts. Um, so I don't see the sacred uh, function of Arabic uh, in, in the Mamluk case, uh, but definitely I see very similar way of uh, adapting, in excluding and uh, including and, and molding existing text to propose new ways of, of legitimation of uh, the Mamluk Sultanate in the presence of an Abbasid Caliph or in the absence of an Abbasid Caliph. So in a way, it's similar to what uh, Yilmaz uh, observed in the Ottoman case. And I think this applies almost to every phase of, of uh, pre-modern Islamic history. But the idea that there are continuous um, 
uh, ways of legitimating rulers or continuous ways of looking at justice or adil or this is all uh, distortion basically and we should always contextualize these ideas yeah, if, if if i may continue and that's i mean the idea of uh, who was it lambton i think that you presented that um there is a very Arab or Arabic centric notion that if it's important, it's in Arabic and all the rest are kind of decoration and we need to Arabicize thing. And, and yeah, I, I, I find it kind of very good. It, it's to the level of we give, we label texts in, uh, in a certain or as a certain language. I, I had this one of our dear colleagues, uh, from another university in London, Muhammad, that we are both uh, very much familiar and appreciate him, asked me at one point to help him with the Persian text. Uh, uh, he said that he will ask my help. And then when I asked him what about the text, he said, I understood everything. He's uh, He works on Arabic, he has superb Arabic, but no official Persian, but he understood everything. He didn't need this assistance of a Persian reader to understand the text, which is Persian. And this is another layer of that is that the labeling or kind of decoration of the grammar or syntax of one language that said, okay, this is Persian, but it's Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is how symmetrical these processes were uh, in terms of flowing between the language that, I don't know, maybe it's actually a question to Ferenc as a more of a, literary scholar here that it's worth considering because it's not only the aesthetics and the syntax it's also values and content sorry i'm blabbering yeah. I, I don't have a no, clear no, but values values are, values are actually a good word here basically so what what we at the same i mean i get what uh, professor amar had is saying but at the same time what, what perhaps we should also consider you know the agency of the author and what he for example you know what he wanted to you know, what, what he wants uh, a text uh, to be in, as it were. So, okay, so uh, case, in, case in point, you know, uh, in Shah text, right? So, uh, epistolary, very heavily, using very heavy Persian, you know, this Persian, Perso Islam, Perso Arabic uh, uh, Chancellor language, right? So basically, uh, uh, and, you know, and but, but and used by let's say both the Mughal Chancery, the the Ottoman Chancery, uh, and the Safavid Chancery. Uh, the main difference being perhaps in in you know in the in a set of finite verbs, right? So like kar and, and uh, etc. Right. So, uh, uh, but uh, so. Uh, 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 so the, what, what I'm driving at is you needed more training in, 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 in this Perso-Arabic uh, Chancery language and sort of the underlying uh, sort of intellectual tradition, Islamic law, uh, Persian poetry, etc., cetera, than actually the, the actual vernacular uh, language, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is so what, what we are talking about. I mean, and I like your... Also, your suggestion is 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 that the the need for studying this whole phenomenon as, as a uh, as a pr product of network, uh, because it's networks who that were reading and, and exchanging uh, among themselves uh, these texts, uh, uh, not sort of national uh, mission. And and um, also we we perhaps need to distinguish the language of chanceries, which are direct legitimation or uh, projecting imperial uh, or, or projecting power versus political thought, which I focus on, where, where these texts are not necessarily to, to project a certain power or to legitimate in a letter between the Mamluks and the Ilkhanids or vice versa, but really to, to, to discuss ideas. What is the limit of, of political power? What, what are the extents of, of the ruler's power? Can you, can you remove a ruler? So these are also very academic discussions in the sense. And this is where they use ideas from all over the Islamic world or non-Muslim non, non world even. Uh, and they remold them, they use them again. Uh, in terms of 
being Perso-centric or Arabo-centric in the 13th century in Cairo, in Damascus. You don't feel that uh, there's any uh, limit to, 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 to ideas ranging from what people call Altaic legitimation, the divine mandate. Uh, these are all ways to, to uh, basically to, to discuss uh, concerns, contemporary concerns to these authors, their, their present and immediate concerns, whether they refer to certain notions from, from pre-Islamic time or the Islamic time or from the Sharia are just ways that are understood by their audience, as, as you mentioned, uh, certain terms uh, to discuss specific ideas. Thank you. Uh, there was one question in the chat. Uh, it was more like more asking for clarification. Like, so was there was the reference to imams of king have any Shia? Does it have any Shia or even Ali connotations? Who were the peers or guides in quotation marks in this? So, so uh, Imam here, uh, this is a very uh, uh, Ash'ari Sufi text, in, in all likeliness uh, a Shafi'i text, and it refers a lot to, uh, uh, to Juwaini, uh, especially to the uh, Fada'ih al batiniya So it is from a completely different tradition. Uh, Imam here means the ruler. Um, the ruler who can be deposed and who can be uh, so he, he is fallible and he can uh, the imam can be deposed and can be changed uh, so it's a different uh, conception of imamate this is more in line with ghazali and juwaini's uh, uh, conception of the imamate and in fact with direct references uh, especially when it comes to the uh, the 10 the 10 rights of the of the the imam over his subjects they're directly uh, based on a shrewd synthesis of Ghazali and Juwaini and do not refer to the, to the Shia tradition. Um, in terms of uh, the Sufi uh, specific order of this author, he made every effort to conceal that and to make it a generic uh, Sufi text. And this is where uh, the use of Mirsad was truly uh, uh, very, very intelligent use of the, of the Mirsad. And uh, we tried to, to identify what kind of tariqa he, he followed. Uh, it is very difficult to, he, he made every effort to make it a generic uh, Sufi text. Uh, I have a problem with, with, <laughs> with, your, <laughs> with, with, with the word pre-modern. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, it really lumps together all sorts of things. So, uh, uh, so do you imply that this set of the understanding between language and, and power uh, or language and politics changed only in the, in the, in, in, with modernity? Because that's what it, this uh, seems to uh, uh, imply. Um, uh, no, in fact... Uh, I don't think so. so I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 do, I do not. It's just because it's, it's a... It's a the, the whole uh, idea is to contextualize this political thought and to avoid, for example, I um, discussed the caliphate and that there is no uh, yearning, continuous yearning in Islamic societies to the caliphate from, from the 9th to the 20th century. This is a construction that people uh, from all uh, ideological backgrounds or political backgrounds in Islamic history at some point Considered that this is a long gone ideal or, or just a romantic idea. Uh, so pre-modern is just was just to avoid uh, uh, medieval in the sense that whatever this period between the classical Islamic period and the early modern Islamic period, which is also very difficult to to pinpoint, as as you know. Sure, sure, sure. That's why that's why I really like your your suggestion that we should approach the whole affair in a kind of a more networked. Uh, you know, uh, fashion. Um, thank you. Further question from the learned audience. Uh, Amir, did you, have you raised your hand? Um, yes, uh, I Go just ahead. wanted to maybe 
well, not challenge, but make an observation that might complement and maybe uh, clash and challenge your points. Uh, I absolutely agree that not just in religious discourse and Sufi discourse, but in political discourse, cultural discourse, all of these things, there's an inherent just acceptance of multilingualism. If, and that's why I emphasize that um, poem at the beginning where the author of the uh, epic, Visor Amin, who's serenading the Seljuk prince, describes him in an inherently multilingual uh, sense. He's saying whatever language he chooses, selects, he can compose miraculous verse, whether it be in Tazi, Arabic, Dari, Persian, or Turki, Turkish. The idea is that to be an erudite prince, and I think in this case to be an erudite uh, scholar, one of the ulama, you have to have the, a masterful kind of command of a multiplicity of these languages. Having said that, I think that some contexts at least in my experience of studying late Safavid Iran and 18th century Iran, there are some languages that come to the fore. So uh, Arabic amongst the Sufis and ulema seems to be quite an important thing um, for Safavids uh, and 18th century kind of scholars and writers. There, it's very common for them to attack one another saying, you don't even know how to, you know, read the Arabic texts properly. Your Arabic grammar and syntax are terrible. So how could you possibly, you know, tell us about the, you know, most Islamic way to rule or Islamic legitimacy? And at the same time, the converse is people write in Arabic when they don't even need to. They're writing treatises, they write Arabic, but even when they compose poetry, even when they deliver sermons in a mosque, they resort to Arabic. Uh, these things, uh, uh, my, my view is limited to very specific uh, context, the uh, late Ayyubid, early Mamluk, uh, even it doesn't apply to the late Mamluk period. So yeah, I, 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 I do not, um, in fact, we agree on this. Later on, things change. Uh, different parts of the Islamic world look at language, uh, at the function of Arabic language differently. So yeah, this could be the case. For example, you've, you've discussed Ajam. Uh, yeah. The uh, Ajam, for example, I look at Ibn Jama'a, uh, who writes in Arabic only, and when he mentions Ajam, Ajam scholars, he's talking about his teachers who are expert in speculative jurisprudence in the madrasa of, of Damascus and Cairo. So Ajam is a complementary word for, for knowledge. Uh, these are the experts of uh, speculative Khusru Shahi and others expert in, in speculative uh, jurisprudence. So these things change, and this is exactly my point, is that we have to look at their sp specific scholarly networks, ideological background, political context. These things are not the same throughout the pre-modern and early modern Islamic history. Thank you. Actually, if I can raise another issue yeah, that okay. goes from Amir's point. Um, one of the things you said, Amir, is that they wrote Arabic when they didn't need to. And this is something that I'm, the necessity of writing in Arabic is a, a, something that I, I kind of question because it's a choice. And why isn't it a legitimate choice for those who have or who master different languages not to choose according to different needs it doesn't need to be communicate certain things it's also to to establish one's position or show off or just because they felt that it's comfortable for them or they want to play with it i mean it's people after all and and people have very complex uh, motive but one of the things that actually Muhammad you said um, that I, I, I'm just again I'm I'm, I'm trying to to grab it's 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 a very complex issue that we are talking about the Islamic nature 
of things that what do you mean when you mean this is Islamic, this is not Islamic? And I'm not sure that it 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 kind of communicate with Amir, you were there for the discussion in the workshop we had on Tuesday about what is the borders of what is considered to be Islamic and what is more Islamic and less Islamic. And this is something that both for us and for people who were writing in the yeah. pre-modern, that I'm not sure how to go around that. But yeah, that's a very interesting Islamic. question. How do we draw the borders of yeah. this? as I call it, Turco-Tajik world, or as you call it, the Islamic uh, world or Islamic world. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the challenge, in fact, that we, we have to continuously work on. And I can give an example just to, to, to discuss it, basically, with no answer or, or no definitive answer. If we look at, at justice, yeah, the notion of Adl, and how Anne Lampton and others up, up till today who continuously talk about Islamic justice versus non-Islamic justice, pre-modern, pre pre-Islamic Arabian, Muru'a and, and Sasanian justice as a secular pre-modern uh, justice. And you look at these mirrors for princes, even when they mention Sasanian uh, kings or, or e Egyptian kings or Alexander the Great, these are just tools to, to, to put limits on the discretionary exercise of power. They are not romantic ways to recreate the Sasanian or Egyptian, uh, Egyptian empire. These are Islamic notions in the sense that they reflect the standards sure. of the Islamic society at Cairo and the late Ayyubid and early Mamluk period. They give examples of a Sasanian king or, or Alexander the Great or, or uh, ancient Egyptian kings or, or Muluk al-Hint, not because they want to re recreate uh, an empire, it's just because these are tools made available to them because they are literateurs, right? They are uh, they're jurists, but they're also poets. They're also, uh, they use it to, to basically curtail the exercise of power. And I call it uh, Islamic notion of justice, but I could easily call it uh, what Amir mentioned, the uh, uh, Tajik or turco Tajik, doesn't matter, but it is only uh, a tool to, to mention Alexander the Great or Aristotle or, uh, or uh, Ardashir is, is only tools. And some people take it too seriously that there's a, a Sasanian notion of justice versus an Islamic notion of justice. I think that the, these, these authors never read anything related to uh, a Sasanian text or a Greek text in Greek, and they had no clue of what uh, society in Athens looked like. So it's just a tool. Uh, to promote justice and curtail the exercise of power. This is my, my, when I, my meaning when I say Islamic, and this will change, of course, with time and with context. Um, if there are no further questions, then uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marhab, uh, for your inspiring okay. talk and but uh, we might want to move on to our next and last speaker of, of this panel uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Dina Khel, I'm not sure if I pronounce his last name well from the University of Peshawar uh, talking about pr the promotion of Tur Turkey to the status of Persian and Arabic Dina Khel. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, session so that I may share my research uh, with this uh, Galaxy of Scholars. So, so first of all, that how I uh, selected this topic for my research. So I was reading this uh, Babar Nama by Zahiruddin Babar and I found that uh, uh, in one place, uh, he uh, has written that Alisher uh, Nawai, that the Chagatai are the, the, the old the Turkic language. Uh, it was the language of the Alisher Nawai. And Alisher Nawai, he belonged to the 15th century. So I wondered that 
why Babur said that the Turkey, the Turkey language, it is the language of Ali Sher Nawai. Because it is, uh, I mean, an uh, uh, old language. So then I started my research. And uh, let me uh, share my study and uh, this research. Uh, I found that uh, in Central Asia, uh, there are uh, three languages they remain dominant uh, the Arabic, uh, Persian, and the Turkey language. So, the structure of my this presentation is that first of all, uh, mm, I will discuss about the Turkey language and literature uh, in Central Asia before Islam, then Arabic as literary language in Central Asia, then Arab's cultural impacts on Central Asia, and that will be followed by Persian uh, language and literature and their cultural impact on Central Asia, and then the emergence of Turkey as literary language while countering Arabic and Persian languages in Central Asia. So uh, uh, initially, uh, the word Turkey, it is found in Chinese sources and in the Arakun inscription. They had their oral as well as written literature. Central Asian national tradition, they lost their significance after the acceptance of Islam. Uh, now about the uh, Central Asian, uh, the, the Turkic sources before Islam in Central Asia. So a Chinese traveler by the name of Hiwan Sang who traveled to Central Asia in the seventh century, he points to the existence of the literature of uh, this sort, but not even the titles uh, come down. I mean, he has he has mentioned that there were some some sources uh, in the in the Turkey language in Central Asia, but even he has not mentioned the titles. Later on, Al Biruni he has uh, he writes that Kutiba bin Muslim, uh, uh, governor of the province of Farasan, he exterminated priests uh, together with their books. But actually, before Islam. Uh, we don't have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, literature in the Turkey language in Central Asia. Later on, the Arabic language uh, in Central Asia. In the past three centuries of the Muhammadan era, the Arabic language remained the language of all sorts of prose literature in Central Asia. In 19th century, uh, a Russian scholar, he has compiled a two-volume anthology of Arabic and Persian sources for the history of the Golden Horde. Uh, later on, he published these uh, sources, he compiled and pu published these in 1834 in St. Petersburg. Uh, these sources will tell us uh, uh, every aspect of everyday life from language to administration and uh, from the sophisticated literary and historiographical tradition to the uh, conducted of trade. I mean that all these uh, themes we can find written in the uh, Arabic language about the Central Asia. Then the, the, the contacts between the Arab and the Central Asian people that can be found that we, we, we see that they are first established in the distant past, as far back as the fifth century. At the time, at that time, big merchants caravans with goods from the cities of Central Asia and Khorasan, they went to the cities of Iraq and Syria via Iran. In Central Asia, uh, in parts of India and Southeast Asia, Islam became the uh, majority religion and, and, and at Swag, the Arabic language was introduced as a vehicle of religion and culture. Moreover, even though these areas were never annexed by Arabic-speaking people, commercial relations with the Central Arab Khun areas were often very, uh, I mean, intense. In the newly uh, in the newly won land conquering Arabs like in, in, from the north side the Syria, Iraq, from the west to Egypt, North Africa, they imposed not just Islam but also Arabic language and Arabian uh, uh, culture. Uh, have, uh, we usually refer to these areas Arab world to the east and northeast uh, the coming of Islam did not produce the same effect. Arab culture 
had, I mean, uh, comparatively, it had little uh, impact. And we can see that uh, 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 Arabic script and uh, a host of the loan words that can be found in the Central Asian Turkey language. When Qutiba bin Muslim, uh, he was the governor of Khorasan, large scale conversion did not take place until several hundred years later when under the influence of the Samanites, Turks in large number, they were uh, induced to accept Islam of their own free will. Individual of Turks have previously accepted Islam, but in 10th century, Islam became dominant factor in Turkish society. When Turkey converted to Islam, they claim a direct link with the Prophet and thereby raise their standing in the eyes of other Muslims. Their traditional history, folklore, and mythology had been altered to accommodate numerous Islamic elements. So, uh, Diwan Logatul Turk, written by Mahmoud Kashgari, it, uh, it exhibit uh, influence from the direction of Arabic Persian literary culture. With the establishment of Baghdad as the political and intellectual capital of the Muslim world of the 18th and 9th century, attempts were made to explore Central Asian region. Muslim authors, they wrote histories, biographical dictionaries, Ufayat, obituaries, theological discussion, legal opinions, geographies, travel literature, political treaties, advice literature, most of these written in Arabic language later translated into Persian. The new civilization brought with it new languages, a new religion, and a new method of administration. So we can also, I mean, this uh, uh, cultural and, and cultural influence, Arab intermarriages with, with Persian, we can also see this aspect. Then the Arab historiography of Central Asia. Uh, many Arab scholars and historians they, they, they have written uh, uh, history of, of the Central Asia, like uh, we can see this Putuhul Buldan by Ahmad bin Yahya al Balazari. Uh, he died in 892. He, uh, he has written uh, uh, about the beginning of the Arab conquest uh, at early 8th century with the appointment of Qutiba bin Muslim as governor of Khorasan in the year 714 AD. Uh, another book written in uh, uh, Arabic language about the history of the Central Asia it is Tariq al-Rusul wal-Muluk. It is written by uh, Abu Jafar Muhammad al-Tabri. He spent most of his uh, time following the travels in Baghdad, the intellectual capital of the Muslim world of that time. He described events that occurred throughout the history of the Umayyad and Abbasid uh, down to the year 1915. Tabri work was later on translated into Persian by Samanite Wazir Balami. Tabri described the fight between the Khorezms and Sogdians. Sogdians wrote to the uh, to the king of Shash, Shash, it is the old name of the Tashkan, and to the uh, El Khash, title of the ruler of the Samarkana, uh, Samarkan. Uh, they wrote that if the Arab vanquish us, uh, they will visit upon you uh, the like of that they brought us. Then uh, there is another book, uh, Abul Hassan Ali. Bini Muhammad al Madaini. He was from uh, Iranian race and wrote in Arabic, according to Faris al Ulum, wrote in greater details than others on the history of Khorasan, India, and Fars. Tabri most frequently quotes this book of Madaini. Uh, early Turkic authors, uh, authors written in Arabic. Uh, then we can see that a lot of uh, uh, Turkic people, authors and writers, they were also written in Arabic language and not in their, uh, their own uh, Turki language. Like Tarihi Bukhara, it is written by uh, Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Jafar al Narshahi. Uh, he was from the village of Narshah near Bukhara. He delivered his history to uh, Samandi Amir Nuh ibn Nasr 
in the year 1943. In his book, he described the rise of Samanides. Uh, it was a Central Asian post Islamic ruling dynasty. They are believed to be descendants of Saman Khuda and influential they come from the vicinity, from the city of Balkhir, northern Afghanistan. Karakhanaid, the first Turkic Muslim dynasty in Central Asia, the period of rule of the Turkish Karakhanaid dynasty is a period of cultural retrogression. Then, Diwan Logatul Turk, as already mentioned, that it is written by Mahmoud Kashgari. Actually, it is uh, uh, about the different uh, dialects of the Turkey language, but he has written it in the Arabic language. The one of the Turk is the earliest known Turkic lexicon. It was written in Arabic in 1075 uh, AD. He came to Baghdad and wrote the Diwan and dedicated it to the Khalif al Muqtadi. It is written for an Arab audience, presumably in order to explain to the court at Baghdad the language and customs of their warlords. So, then the Turkey literature in the uh, in Central Asia uh, after Islam. Uh, like there is a very important uh, a sort of advice literature by the name of Qutud Gubilig that is written by Yusuf Has Hajib. Uh, it is in, in, in the Turkey language. Central Asian own rich textual tradition later on we can see uh, as already I mentioned that Babar he called this Alishir Nawai, a 15th century poet and writer, that the, the Turki, uh, it is language of the Alishir Nawai. So from 15th century onward, we can see a lot of uh, textual tradition in the uh, Turki language, so from, particularly from 16th to 19th century. Only, but uh, these uh, uh, different uh, sources, we can find these in manuscript form and uh, majority of these sources written in the Turkey language, they are unedited and uh, unpublished. They are available in different libraries, catalogs are being published over there, but the manuscript, they are unedited and unpublished. Then the, the Persian uh, as literary language in Central Asia, like uh, as already I, uh, I said that uh, until the, the third century Hijra, Arabic, it was the language of almost uh, uh, majority of the prose works. So from the fourth century Hijra, the Persian language gradually established itself as the literary language. The number of prose composition in Turkey language, it was still extremely insignificant. Uh, Persian uh, uh, impacts like the literary, cultural and linguistic impacts on the on the Tur Turkey language and uh, as a whole on the Central Asia. So this Qutud Gubilik, it is a long didactic poem in a partial Islamic mirror for Francis tradition. Mirror for Francis it is a particular genre like the wise literature. Then different uh, Iranian civilization, we can also see that they had their deep roots in this, in this region of the Central Asia. So, these different civilizations, they had uh, their impacts on the Central Asia and uh, different, uh, I mean, dialects of the, of the Persian language, like Dari and Tajiki, it is spoken here in the uh, Central Asia. Religious landscape was uh, shared by Zoroastrian Buddhist, Buddhism, Buddhist and Manishian and Jewish tradition. Uh, Samanite era, uh, mm, and in this particular, in the Samanite era, Bukhara became famous for construction of libraries and scholarship. Samanites, they patronized writers and scholars no less than the, the Boyd. Boyd, it was a Shia Iranian dynasty from 1933 to 1062. Samanites, they being, uh, although they were Persians, they patronized chiefly Persian poetry, but along with these, uh, there were at the report, many poets who wrote in Arabic language. The fourth, uh, uh, there is a book by uh, by the name of uh, uh, Mutanabi. Uh, so it is written by Salabi. In fourth section, uh, we can uh, uh, of this book, uh, we can find poets that uh, they have written in the 
uh, I mean their poetry in the uh, Arabic language. Uh, similarly, uh, another book, Hududul Alam, uh, The Frontiers of the World by a, an unknown author, it was compiled in the 982. The unknown author dedicated the manuscript to uh, a member of the uh, uh, Faragunaid dynasty, vassals of the Samanid in northern Afghanistan. It is also written in the Persian, but falls into the category of the uh, uh, geography, geographical literature. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the background of the dominant uh, languages uh, uh, in Central Asia, uh, like the first the Arabic language and then the, the Persian language, then how the Central Asian uh, uh, poets, writers, uh, they realized that why we should not, I mean, write in our own Turkey language. So their efforts, efforts of, uh, uh, for identity, uh, in this uh, context, uh, we can, uh, like already I, uh, I shared that this, uh, the work of Mahmoud Kashgari, the one law to Turk, it is very important. He became deeply convinced of the need to enlighten the Arabs uh, about the Turks in their uh, language. And to that end, he developed the uh, remainder of his life. I mean that uh, there are two important writers. Uh, uh, the first one is this Mahmoud Kashgari. Uh, uh, he tried to convince the Arabs about the, uh, the importance and significance of the Turki language. And then the next one is the uh, Alishir Nawai, that he tried to compare uh, uh, and prove uh, um, Turkey language is, uh, I mean, superior to the Persian language. So here I'm talking about this, the efforts of the Mahmud Kashgari, and later on I will uh, discuss the efforts of the um, uh, another, this uh, uh, Alishir Nawai. So for many years, uh, he traveled through the length and breadth of Central Asia, he was visiting its cities and living among its uh, nomadic tribes, carefully recording all that he saw and heard, and settling eventually in Baghdad. He there used uh, his notes to write in, seven, uh, in 1074 AD a book titled Diwan Logatul Turk. We can say, I mean, to the dictionary of the Turkish languages. So, uh, the work is, it is this Diwan, it is a sort of encyclopedia and content, Central Asiatic history, geography, biography, genealogy, folklore, mythology, customs, traditions, language and scientists and many other objects uh, are touched on by this uh, Mahmoud al Kashgari. Uh, among this mass of data are to be found various evidences of the uh, extent of the impact of Islam on the uh, on the Turks. So, uh, actually, he has compiled this data in the in the Central Asia in the uh, Turkic world, and then he went and settled in the Baghdad and compiled his book, the one there in Arabic language. Uh, now, uh, incorporating Turks in the Muslim uh, historiography. The origin of the Turks, it is, uh, I mean, still uh, debated. There are different views of different authors and historians about the origin, but it is established that they emerged as a significant political power rather than an ethnic category uh, in, the, in Mongolia in the middle of 6th century. Turks were popularly uh, considered better soldiers and royal servants of the year new hostel. Muslim historian and geographers felt the need to explain their origins and find ways to include the Turks in the Muslim narrative. The Turks were therefore incorporated into the Muslim account of creation and were uh, accorded their place in the history as descendants of Iafis, one of the new three sons, new the prophet of Allah. Uh, 
Muslim authors also sought to explain the Turks' influential presence within the boundaries of Muslim civilization. Uh, <clears throat> it is very interesting that uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, find uh, that these Turks writers, they have uh, uh, written some uh, hadiths to prove the superiority of Turkey language and the Turk people. Uh, like during the first several centuries followed the, the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, various political and religious factions gave currency to thousands of spurious hadiths and defense of their particular tenets are to prove a point of law or doctrine they wish to make. So Kashgari related to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to Hadith, which have a particularly Turkish flag. The first which he gives uh, in his introductory remarks uh, in his book, The One of the Turk in the introduction, he writes that the prophet said, learn the Turkish language, learn the Turkish language for their for their rule will long endure. Uh, Mahmud Kashgari, he declares that he had uh, the Hadith from a reliable Imam of Bukhara and also independently from one in Nishapur, both of whom uh, have sworn to its authenticity and related with complete Islam. He fails, however, to name either of the two Imams uh, to give the alleged is not, he said, if this hadith be true, then the learning of the Turkish language is obligatory uh, for every Muslim. If it be not true, then the reason still orders it, I mean that the learning of the Turkish language is significant and important. Uh, Mahmud Kashgari, he was extremely proud of his Turkish ancestry and his aim in writing the Diwan was to facilitate the learning of Turkish by Arabs. By 1074, Turks had the seven power of Islam in their hands and the authority of the side caliphs uh, had become no more than knowledge. Thus the Hadith served the double purpose of establishing a link with the Prophet and at the same time of showing that the Prophet himself had recommended what he, I mean Al-Kashkari, was also educating, namely the learning of the uh, Turkish by the Arab. The second hadith, uh, according to Kashgari, uh, was obtained with complete snath from a sheikh al-Imam al-Zahid al-Hussein ibn al-Khalafi, who had had it from Ibn Abi al dunya also known as Ibn al gharqi as well as from a book written by a Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Mufid al-Jarjai. That uh, hadith which he has mentioned, it states that God said, I have a host which I have called Turk and settled in the east. If any people shall arouse my wrath, I shall give them into the power of this Host. Uh, Mahmoud Kashgari, uh, while commenting uh, on this uh, second hadith, he said that this is then for the Turks, a superiority uh, over all other people because God took upon himself the naming of them. Uh, he settled them in the most excellent place on earth and territories cause air in the best, and he called them by host. Uh, moreover, in the Turks, Kashgari writes further, he tries to explain that moreover in the Turks are to be seen innumerable praiseworthy qualities such as beauty, geniality, kindness, breeding, respect for personages, fulfillment of promise, modesty, a lack of boosting valor and manliness. The hadith can also be viewed as an indirect attempt uh, uh, on the part of Al-Kashgari to uh, justify the 
usurpation of power in Baghdad by the Turk sense in the light of the Hadith. It could be argued that the Arab Abbasid had, by the action, incurred the wrath of God who had uh, thereupon his promise brought down to them his Turkish cost. This Hadith provided the Turks with a religious origin for their name, but not for the Turkish people themselves. So, Turks remember popular uh, 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 sort of legend uh, Argeni Khan and the uh, white wolf of their origin. Uh, Kashgari once uh, said that all 20 principal branches of the Turkish people can trace their descent back to Turk. Turk, uh, according to Kashgari, he was the son of Yafis, and Yafis, he was the son of Nuh, the prophet. Uh, then in his uh, uh, entry uh, for the word Turk, Kashgari in his Diwan, he has, uh, it is a sort of uh, uh, dictionary, so he has explained uh, different words. So once he has written that Turks, uh, they are, uh, I mean, descendant of the, of the Turk, and Turk, he was the son of Yafis, and Yafis was the son of Nuh. But in another place in his Diwan, uh, uh, when he has explained the word Turk, so he writes, Turk is the name of the son of Nuh. Uh, before this, he has written that uh, the son of Nuh, he was Yafis, and the son of Yafis was Turk. But here, while he is, uh, I mean, explaining the word Turk, he writes that Turk is the name of the son of Nu, the prophet. The intervening Yafis, which already he mentioned, he has omitted here. Uh, the Hadith thus serves to support the eulogistic opening paragraph of the Diwan in which the author asserts. In the opening paragraph, the author, he has written that, when I saw that God most high has caused the son of fortune to rise in the zodiac of the Turks and set their kingdom among the spears of heaven that he called them Turk and gave them a rule, making them kings of the age and placing in their hands the reins of temporal authority, appointing them over all mankind and directing them to the right, that he strengthen them who are affiliated to them and those who endure on their behalf, so that they attain from them the utmost of their desire and are delivered from the uh, ignominy of the slavish rebel. Then I saw that uh, every man of the reason must attach himself to them or else expose himself to their falling arrows and there is no better way to approach them than by uh, speaking their own tongue, thereby bending their ear and inclining their heart. And when one of their pools comes over to their side, they keep the, him secure from fear of them. Then others may take refuge with them and all fear of harm be gone. It is the, the opening paragraph of the Diwan Logat of uh, Instead of Arabic words, uh, Allah and Rasulullah, uh, Kashgari used Turkish words, Tangri and Yalawash, respectively in his Diwan. Uh, Central Asiatic Turks had been using the, the 12 uh, uh, animal uh, calendar. So I mean that they are not using this uh, sort of Hijri or uh, Islamic calendar, but they are using their own traditional uh, calendar. Uh, they had no names for the seven days of the, of the week and uh, uh, Arabic months names were used only in the, uh, in the city. So uh, then we can also find Hadith on the superiority of the, uh, uh, of the city of Bukhara. And here we can see that once again, uh, there is a shift from the 
uh, uh, from Arabic to the Persian language. Like this, so uh, Hadith on the superiority of uh, Bukhara. Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Ahmad bin Sulaiman al-Bukhari. He wrote a book on the capital of Samanides, Bukhara, somewhat later in 1943-44. Abu Bakr Muhammad bin Jafar al-Narshakhi, who died in 19, 959. He presented uh, this book to Nuh bin Nasr, a history of Bukhara, written in Arabic. Hadith from the Prophet and his disciples are quoted on the superiority of this town. Uh, in the 13th century, with the people of, from the greater part nourished to uh, no inclination toward the study of the Arabic books, Abu Nasr Ahmad bin Muhammad al Qubawi, by request of his friends, he translated this book uh, into Persian language. Uh, then the last, uh, I mean, the efforts so, uh, uh, ab uh, about the uh, superiority of uh, Turkey language uh, as compared to the uh, Persian language. Already I mentioned this uh, uh, Alishir Nawai. Uh, Alishir Nawai, he has written an important book by the name of Muhakimatul Lugatin. Muhakimatul Lugatin, uh, we can uh, translate it a judgment between two languages. So, like uh, Kashgari, already, is, uh, already we mentioned that Kashgari does not pursue the matter uh, of the genealogy of the, of the Turks further, but an em amplification of this religious version of the origin of Turks is to be found in the Muhakimatul Lugatain of Ali Shir Nawai. Ali Shir Nawai, uh, he has written that when the Prophet Luke was delivered from the disasters of the flood and once again set foot upon the ground, no traces of mankind remained in the world. Then Nuh sent to the land of Khata, his son Yafis, who is said by historian to have been the father of the Turks. And he, the Nu, made Sam, who has been described as the father of the Persians, the ruler of the lands of Iran and Turan. And he sent Ham, who is said to be the father of the Hindus, to the land of Hind, India. Historians say that Yafis, father of the Turks, was a prophet. And for this reason, was deemed superior to his brothers. Actually, uh, Ali Shir Nawai in uh, his this uh, book, Muhakimatul Lugatain, he has tried uh, to compare two languages, Persian and the Turkey language. But he has started uh, from the um, uh, comparison of the uh, three sons of the new prophet. Like he had three sons, Yafis, Sam, and Ha. Uh, and he tried to prove that Yafis, he was a prophet. And the Turks, they are the descendants of the Yafis. So the Turks, they are superior to the uh, uh, descendants of the other sons of the prophet. Like the Sam, whose descendants are the Persian, and the Ham, whose descendants are the, the Indian people. So here he has tried that Yafis, he was a prophet. So being descendant, the Turks being descendants of the prophets, they are superior and their language is superior to the Persian as well as the Hindi language of the India. Muhakimatul uh, Lugatain, as already I told that it is a judgment between the two languages. Uh, it is we can say it is that it is a masterpiece of the Nawai. It is last work of the Nawai who completed it in December 1499 AD. He defended his thesis that Turkey language it is superior than Persian uh, for literal purposes. purposes. Repeatedly, Nawai he emphasizes his, his, his belief in the richness, precision, and malleability of the 
Turkic vocabulary as opposed to Persian. For example, he has written that Turks have a word for the beauty, beauty mark on the woman's face, but there is no uh, uh, comparable word in the Persian. Uh, similarly, he has written that many uh, Turkey words have three or four or more meanings. Persian, according to Nawai, lacks such flexible words that have, I mean, four, three, four, or five or more meanings. Uh, and he has also written that uh, uh, Turkic languages, uh, this Turkey language, have nine words used to identify a separate species of uh, duck, which illustrates the capacity of the uh, Turkic languages uh, to make more precise distinction. Persian, according to Nawai, uh, has but one word that covers all uh, of these. So now let me conclude this uh, discussion. Uh, that uh, uh, before Islam, according to different uh, historians like the Chinese traveler Thi Wan Sang, and later on this uh, Central Asian uh, writers, Thi Wan Sang he has written that there were books in Central Asia written in Turkey language, but later on the historian said that even he has not mentioned uh, any single title. So we can't say that whether they were books written in Turkey language or not. Uh, uh, later on this, uh, uh, the author of the Kitabul Hind, he has written that uh, uh, when Kutiba bin a Muslim, he came to Central Asia and there were, I mean, people uh, and priests who have written the Turkey language, but he exterminated these uh, priests and he also uh, um, sort of destroyed their books. So, but then the, the, the researchers, they are, they are saying that even uh, this the author of the, I forgot his name, the author of the Kitabul Hind, he has also not mentioned even a single title of these books uh, written in Turkey language before Islam. Later on, the Arab people, they wrote about Central Asia, wrote about the uh, Turkey, the Turkic people, about their history, about their geography, and all these works we can find in the Arabic language uh, till the third century Hijri. Arabic, it was a dominant uh, language of prose in the Central Asia. Uh, and after the fourth century, we can find the, the Persian as a dominant uh, language. Uh, meanwhile, we can also see that the, the Turkic people, they were also writing in Arabic and later on in the Persian languages. And But at the same time, at the 11th century, we can also find a book of this Qutudu uh, Belig, uh, written by Yusuf Khasa Gibbetes in the ancient Turkey language, but uh, this Mahmoud Kashgari, uh, although he uh, has written his book in the Arabic language, but it is about the, the Turkey people, their language, their geography, their culture, mythology, history, folklore, and all these things. He collected data and then he compiled his book while sitting in Baghdad. And then Alishir Nawai formally. Mahmud Kashgari, uh, he was, uh, I mean, uh, on one hand, he was trying to convince the Arabic people about the uh, significance and importance of the Turkey language. And uh, Alishir Nawai, he was trying to prove the superiority of Turkey language over the, particularly over the, the Persian language. In his book, Muhakimatul Nawatain, uh, he has written that Arabic it is a sort of sacred language for we people because it's a language of the Holy Quran, it is a language of the Islam. But here he, he said that here I am trying to compare not the Turkey language with the Arabic language, but 
the, to compare the Turkic language with only with the Persian language. And then he has tried his best to uh, prove his Turkic language as superior uh, to the um, Persian language. Uh, so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dina uh, The floor is open for questions. Okay, so there is a question in, in, in the chat box. Uh, did Navoi also compose in Persian or Arabic? What was the position of his Timurid patrons who funded many Persian works? Uh, you need to unmute ah, yourself. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, Alishir Nawai, he himself at that time uh, wrote poetry in the Persian language. Uh, initially, when he was writing poetry, he was composing poetry in the Persian language. He was using uh, his pen name, which is called Takhallus as Fani. So he himself uh, mm, uh, I mean, wrote in the Persian language, but it is his last work. Muhakimatul Logaten. He wrote this book. Uh, we can say some uh, almost one years before his death. So finally, he convinced that uh, uh, Turkey it is superior as to the uh, as compared to the Persian language. Although at that time, also the people they were writing in. Uh, in, in the Persian language, and as I told you, that he himself uh, he has written in the Persian language. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Amir. Um, thank you for that very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to perhaps uh, take your last point that he composed the Muhakkamat al uh, just a year before his death. And all throughout his life, he had composed in, of course, Turkish, which he's very well known for now, but also um, Persian. His divan in Persian is rather quite copious uh, work. And the quality of the work is impressive. It's uh, his Turkish verse and his Persian verse are equally uh, illustrative of his literary genius. Do you think, however, that the fact that he wrote the Muhakkamat al just a year prior to his death at the culmination of his career is reflective in any way of his frustration that his Turkish verse was not as widely appreciated as his verses in Persian and in Arabic? Is this maybe reflective of the wider society uh, of Timurid elites and their kind of focus on Persian and Arabic rather than uh, Turkish? Uh, actually, one reason he has mentioned in his Diwan, uh, this Muhakim uh, of that why he, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, wrote this Muhakim uh, of uh, he has written that uh, many uh, Turkic people, authors and writers, they are writing in the uh, in the Persian language and they are ignoring their own uh, Turkic language. So uh, he said that uh, um, this is my struggle that uh, uh, to convince my own people that why they are uh, sort of underestimating their own language and their uh, writing. Maybe uh, he has realized this, uh, this uh, 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 Turkic identity and uh, you are very right that maybe uh, his works written in the Persian language 
uh, they have not got uh, so much appreciation. Uh, that is why that he, but he has written that uh, only uh, that I'm, I, I'm noticing that our own people, they are underestimating their language and they are writing in Persian language. So I wrote this book uh, and I proved the superiority of the Turkey language or the Persian language so that uh, our own people, uh, they may know uh, that our language, it is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a language of the level of the Persian, and Arabic, and other advanced languages. Uh, I have some comments and questions. Um, <clears throat> one, 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 just a very small bit that Navai also has an Arabic dictionary, uh, which is published by Agassur 11th. 11th. Uh, the but, but more importantly, uh, so, I mean, you also, also mentioned that, you know, instead of Allah in the Divan Lugat Turk, Turk, you have the, uh, you have, uh, you know, the indigenous Turkic vocabulary uh, instead of uh, borrowing the Arabic vocabulary. So instead of uh, Allah, you have uh, Tengri and in, uh, I don't know, there are quite a number of other examples. Uh, so what's your take on that? Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Mahmoud Kashgari, he collected the folklore uh, of the people different, I mean, uh, the poetry, uh, the, folk, the folk poetry, and the, the people, the, the masses, the common people, uh, they were using, uh, I mean, these local words, uh, uh, and they were they have not used at that time the Arabic uh, language like the Rasul Allah and Rasulullah. So uh, uh, here he has uh, uh, actually he has written that uh, I am trying to convince the Arab people that uh, uh, our language. It is like he uh, uh, he quoted these two hadiths to prove the superiority. So he means that uh, our language it is uh, uh, I mean quite uh, important and significant language, and uh, we have words for uh, all these uh, uh, religious uh, I mean uh, figures and all these things. So. Maybe he has tried that uh, uh, our language has the capacity and there is no uh, uh, contrast and conflict with the Arabic language and we have our indigenous words. Right, but then, sure, sure enough, but then later various Turkic uh, literary languages, they did uh, adopt a word like Allah. So then what happened? Uh, maybe that uh, he tried to prove the language uh, in the religious context, because while presenting hadith uh, to prove the superiority, so that is why that uh, uh, he has tried to uh, include these indigenous words uh, in his dictionary. Uh, that uh, the non-Turkic people, so that they may, I mean, uh, know uh, the uh, uh, what we can say the flexibility and the uh, uh, sort of broader vocabulary of the uh, Turkic language. All right. Um, are you also sure that you know he was kind of doing this folkloric work, and, and then Professor Amar have, will have a question. For, uh, so, because I mean, he himself says that he comes from the Karakhanid, uh, uh, you know, aristocracy. Uh, I mean, I would frankly, I would, I would rather read it more as a kind of a political work of of of. I don't know, pursuing some kind of, uh, uh, you know, this is dedicated to the caliph. Uh, so I was wondering, 
if this is uh, somehow a, a cultural project uh, uh, for a you know a Karahanid uh, family member, um, you know, positioning the Karahanids uh, in the caliphate. I mean, by the by the time he writes this, I I, I believe they are, they have already been the under the under the Seljuks, I think. So, uh, just wondering. So, was is there some politics there? Oh, um, um, for sure, because he has dedicated this to the to the caliph. But so far as this the the folkloric data is concerned, so men am. Uh, it was that uh, he was trying to explain all of the dialects of the, uh, I mean, different dialects of the Turkey language. So he has collected uh, this folkloric and all these uh, fieldwork data to uh, better explain the, the different dialects of the uh, Turkey language. Okay. Professor Marham. Thank you. Uh, just a question, which uh, when you mentioned the translation of God with Tengeri, I mean, use of Tengeri, uh, I wonder about these uh, Mongolian languages or what later is called Tatar or Mer Merkits. And uh, are they mentioned as Turkic languages in these in these texts? Are they referred to as, as Turkic languages? Uh, later on, Ibn al-Athir refers to the Mongols as a Turkic people. But what about Turkic... Uh, dictionaries, Turkic text, did they also see the, the, the Tatars, the Mon Mongolian speaking tribes as, as Turkic? Uh, actually, this, the, the, the Arhun inscription, which the, the Turkic people, they claim that uh, that is their first, I mean, written sample of their Turkey language. It is this, uh, it is uh, uh, located in the in the Mongolia, it is not located in the in the in, in the Turkic region, and uh, some some people they have I mean included this Mongolian as the Turkic people, but so far as this Mahmud Kashgari his divan is concerned, so he has not mentioned the Mongolian, but all of the dialects and different regions of the Central Asia till the basically he was. From the Kashgar, uh, I mean, bordering with the with the China, so he is include including all these area as the Turkic region and not the Mongolian. He has not used the word Mongol, but only the uh, Turkic word, and from different languages like this. Uh, uh, um, uh, another language, just I forgot the name, but he has also considered. Uh, that language is a dialect of the Turkic language. It's not, he is not considered that a separate language, but he is considered that it is a dialect of the, uh, of the Turkic language. And that is why he has collected data from the different regions and included all these uh, varieties uh, as dialect of the a broader and great uh, Turkic language, not different languages. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, if there aren't further questions, uh, then uh, I think we should uh, uh, close for now and have lunch and then uh, come back uh, I believe in an hour and a half. Yes, uh, half past one is when we commence the okay. last panel, panel four, uh, led by and chaired by Roy Fischel. It will consist of two um, okay. presentations, one on Nader Shah uh, and the other on the poetics uh, and protest theology in the late 19th and early 20th century in South Asia. All right, well then we should thank our speakers as well as the audience. Uh, so uh, see you later then. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Shirke. Goodbye. 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 Hello. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Um, do you want to start or? Uh, sure, I'll just, uh, well, I suppose I'll just introduce you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's nice to have you back. Um, this panel will be chaired by Roy Fischel, who is my supervisor and who has kindly um, offered to join us and chair this last panel. This last panel is, I have to admit, uh, a little bit close to my own heart because it's very much um, to do with my own research. At least the first presenter's uh, subject is to do with my own research. The first presenter is Mohammed Habib Sashmali, who is joining us from Istanbul. And he's going to be presenting on Nader Shah's challenge to the Ottomans at the heart of Islam. And after that, we're going to be joined by Dr. Saida Mir Sadri from the University of Paderborn. And she will be discussing the poetics and protest theology uh, that is um, that was current in the very early uh, era of modernity. So we have going from the 18th to the early 20th century, covering a wide expanse and a lot of subjects that are intermingled across this Turco-Tajik world. Other than that, I would like to hand it over to Roy and Let's begin. Thank you, Amir. And thank you all for joining back from uh, lunch, assuming that you are in this area of time zones. Um, um, I think that, uh, Amir, you've presented our speaker, so we can start with the um, first presentation. So please uh, go ahead. I'll make noises when we are starting to run out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Roy, and thank you, Emir. I'm happy uh, to be here and to be in the last uh, presentation, to be in the last panel as well. Uh, so everyone is, I guess, tired and I don't expect tough questions uh, <laughs> in this panel. Uh, so let me first uh, share my screen. I guess I can, yes, that's great. I, I just to test whether PowerPoint is working or not, I'm shifting pages and is it okay? Great. And um, we are in the first page. Yes, now first page. Now you, sh you should see something else. Do you see another page? No. No. We are still in the first page. Oh, that is that is not not okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. Now it's moved. <laughs> yeah, but I and I want it delay. this way. Oh. So now, for example, I again change the page. I'm still continuing to change. Does it affect? No. Yeah, we are on page two. Oh, now we are jumping to five. So I think that it just need to. Yeah, yeah. Now it's good. Okay, yeah. let's let's keep it that way then. Okay. Um, and this might even be better. Okay, thank you. So first of all, let me tell you that um, this presentation is derived from my PhD thesis that I defended last September uh, at University of California, Davis, uh, under the supervisorship of Baki Tezjan. And it was composed of it, uh, of eight chapters and today I'm going to present uh, a part from the last chapter. So the Afsharit Nadir 
expelled the Ottomans from Iran successfully in the end of 1735 after a series of fights to recover the former Safavid provinces since 1730. Following this victory, Nadir founded what he claimed to be a Sunni dynasty in Iran in 1736, replacing the Shi'i Safavids and was entitled as Nadir Shah. For concluding peace with the Ottomans, he proposed five conditions, two of which created serious conflict conflicts in the following decade. Let me show you these five proposals as well. Um, so first he demanded the Ottoman Sultan to accept Jafarism, the common legal school of Iranians, as the fifth Sunni school, and the latter's authority as the caliph of all Muslims. Second, Nadir asked for the allocation of a special prayer corner Rukun in the Kaaba for Jafari pilgrims. There is a consensus in modern scholarship that the port had considered both demands impermissible from the beginning. Based on close reading of Ottoman and Persian sources of the time, my paper argues that in the first reply in 1736, the port only rejected the Rukun in the Kaaba, but tacitly acknowledged Jafarism as a legitimate Sunni legal school. However, Nadir insisted on the, on the visibility of Jafarism in Islam's heartland, underlining the indivisibility of his proposals. Istanbul began to reject Jafarism explicitly only after Nadir's insistence. Why did the Ottomans change their position? What were the inter-imperial implications of Nadir's Jafarism and Rukn offers? And why did he formulate them as inalienable from one another? I explore these questions within the framework of the geopolitical dynamics of inter-imperial rivalry among prominent Muslim empires, focusing on the visibility aspect. I argue that the shared religio-political culture among the Ottoman, Persian, and Arabic spheres made visibility and publicity the very objects for which the Ottoman and Iranian rulers competed to gain political superiority. An Ottoman concession of Nadir Shah's demands would have provided substantial legitimacy for Nadir Shah within and beyond Persia. What mattered for the port was more the religio-political challenge of Nadir to the House of Osman through shared visible symbols than the legitimacy of Jafarism according to Sunnism. The Iran-Ottoman conflict revolving around the Jafarism proposal took 11 years to be resolved between 1736 and 1747. This period can be divided into two as peaceful and hostile, taking the outbreak of war in 1733 as the dividing point. In what follows, I will only explore the first part of the conflict covering the seven year period between 1736 and 1742. I discuss this period under two titles as inauguration of the proposal and escalation of the conflict taking the year 1738 as the beginning of the escalation period. The inauguration section explores Nadir Shah's inauguration of the Jafarism proposal in 1736 and investigates the negotiation process between the Ottoman and Persian delegations in Istanbul in the same year. The escalation part covers the continuation of negotiations through diplomatic correspondence between 1738 and 1742. So... The Ottoman and Persian delegations discussed Nadir's proposals over eight conferences in 13 sessions in Istanbul in August and September 1736. At the end of one month negotiations, the Ottoman side explicitly accepted the following three proposals. The appointment of residents to the respective capitals, the nomination of an Iranian Emir al-Hajj, commander of the pilgrims, and third, freeing and exchanging prisoners. Regarding, regarding the two most controversial demands, the port implicitly recognized Jafarism as a Sunni school, but explicitly rejected a Jafari Rukn in the Kaaba. As modern scholarship commonly assumed that the Ottomans refused to accept Jafarism as a Sunni school from the outset explicitly, I will discuss the Ottoman implicit acceptance of Jafarism below. The clearest evidence for the Ottoman acceptance is that the peace agreement, Ahit Nami Humayun, sent by Mahmud I, the Sultan, to Nadir Shah, stated that 
in doctrine, the people of Persia had joined the Sunni sect as before. The agreement mentioned the new doctrinal school of the Persians as Sunnism, but left the legal school they would follow, which was nothing else than Jafarism, unspecified. Besides, the Ottomans showed their acceptance of Nadir's state as a Sunni state through the letters of the Sultan, the Grand Vizier, and the Sheikh Islam unequivocally. All of these congratulated Nadir for, remo for removing heresy, and erecting the columns of the Prophet Sunnah in Iran. Another expression of the new Ottoman acceptance of the Persians as Sunnis was that the Ottomans and the Persians were to add more praises to one another's titles in correspondence due to the correction of the sect of the Iranians. The Ottoman side also accepted to send two Ottoman ulema to Iran who were to declare the Ottoman caliphs support to Nadir in a congregational Friday prayer. The silence of the Ottoman letters on Jafarism was another indicator of the Ottoman implicit acceptance of Jafarism. Only the letter of Sheikh Hulistan Feyzullah Efendi Zadeh Mustafa Efendi referred to Jafarism by name. He first listed the three proposals of Nadir that the Ottomans explicitly accepted. Then he wrote the other demands as the acceptance of Imam Jafar's legal school as the fifth Sunni school and the establishment of Rukn for the Jafaris in the Kaaba. Surprisingly, the Sheikh Islam started to provide his indirect legal excuses for not accepting a Jafari Rukn in the Kaaba and continued the latter without coming back to the Jafari question. He completely omitted the demand for the acceptance of Jafarism as the fifth school. The Sheikh Islam's mentioning of the Jafari proposal among Nadir's demands, but leaving it unanswered in the letter shows a conscious neglect. It gave Nadir the message that the Ottomans had no problem with the Jafari legal school as long as he did not ask for the explicit recognition of it. Contemporary historians, unlike their modern counterparts, underlined the Ottoman tacit acceptance of Jafarism as well. Shemdani Zadi Süleyman Efendi wrote in his chronicle that the government consented to the Jafari school by reasoning that it is their Persian school, it does not affect us. Muhammad Esterabadi, Nadir's official chronicler, highlighted that the Ottoman Sultan's letter did not show explicit acceptance of the Jafari school. Esterabadi did not write that the porch refused to accept Jafarism. On the other hand, he does explain the clear Ottoman rejection of the Rukn offer. The Iranian version of the Nejef document, which was signed at the end of the Council of Nejef in the end of 1730, 1742 in Baghdad, drew attention to the Ottoman acceptance of Jafarism in the first instance again. The document stated that the Ottoman government accepted four of Nadir's five offers in 1736, including the legitimacy of Jafarism. The document uh, states that Ottoman state, statesmen accepted the Jafari sect. Why then did the Ottomans categorically reject to grant explicit recognition to Jafarism? This question requires us to look at the internal and external dimensions of Nadir Shah's religious proposals of Jafarism and Rukn in the Kaaba. As modern historians suggest, internally, the proposal would have weakened the legitimacy of the Safavid dynasty which could have re-emerged against Nadir at any time. Moreover, there were many Sunni subjects in Persia and in Nadir's army. To find a middle way between Sunnis and Shis would have helped to conciliate the differences in Persian society. In the external side, which is the focus of this paper, if Jafarism was accepted as a Sunni legal school, the Ottomans could not have easily justified their attacks against the Persians on the basis of the Iranian heresy. More importantly, Jafarism would have worked as a facilitator for Nadir's imperial aims. As Nadir's ambitions extended beyond the boundaries of Iran, embracing an ecumenical religious weave would have matched with his universal ideals perfectly. Hamid Algar underlines that the establishment of a Jafari Rukn at Kabe would have been the outward sign of the Ottoman acceptance of Jafarism as the fifth Sunni legal school. Considering the Ottoman compliance to Jafarism 
this outward sign emerges as the most problematic element in Nadir's proposal from the viewpoint of the court. Negotiations in Istanbul, Ottoman letters to Nadir and Mahmoud's instructions to, to the Ottoman ambassador to Iran show that the port formulated its delicate response by paying attention to the difference between internal and external aspect of Jafar's proposal. It is important at this point to underline that both Nadir Shah and the Iranian mission in Istanbul portrayed the Jafar's proposal only as an internal affair, claiming that the completion of Nadir's kingship in Persia depended on the acceptance of his demands by the Ottoman Sultan due to the former's unsettled authority over his realm. Critically, during the discussions among Ottoman ulema and statesmen regarding the sending of two Ottoman ulema to Iran, the Ottomans concluded that the demanded two ulema could be sent because the demand seemed to be related to the strengthening of Nadir's uncertain authority in Iran. The royal authorization for sending the Ottoman ulema shows that the port had no problem with the internal aspect of Jafarism. Unlike its, unlike its implicit recognition, the port unequivocally rejected the external aspects of the Jafari proposal. The Kabe stood as the single most critical symbol over which Ottoman and Iranian rulers engaged in a religio-political competition throughout the entire Jafari debates. In the conferences, conferences in Istanbul, the Ottoman representatives made it clear that the congregational prayer at a designated location for the Jafari pilgrims in the Kaaba is their major concern. After providing several reasons, one of which was the creation of this order, Fitna, in the Hijaz, due to the religious fanaticism of the people of the Hijaz against unfamiliar sects, they call it that way, they emphasized that this proposal is harmful to the order of the sublime sultanate and should be withdrawn. The Grand Vizier's letter also drew attention to the would-be opposition of the people of the Hijaz to such a change and expressed Ottoman uneasiness with the allocation of a special prayer location for pilgrims of a certain country in practice. He underlined that people have so far prayed not according to their country, but according to the legal sect they followed across countries. The Grand Vizier's words also implied that the port was not comfortable with the propaganda aspect of a Jafari Rukm. He wrote that Nadir's achievement in Persia and the Sultan's support of it would have been heard by every Muslim, lowly or distinguished, in the Kaaba, which was the gathering place of ethnicities in the world. Thus, there was no reason to create disorder in the Hijaz. Mustafa Pasha, the Ottoman ambassador to Iran, was instructed by Mahmoud that should Nadir ask further questions about the written issue, the ambassador needed to raise the following points. The Ottoman dynasty had acquired the title of Caliph of God by incorporating the two holy sanctuaries into the Ottoman domains. However, they refrained from calling themselves ruler of the Haramein, Hakimul Haramein, and, inst in, and instead called themselves servant of the Haramein. These holy sanctuaries were like two stable poles and had several special privileges. It was an established custom of the Ottoman dynasty to leave everything in these sanctuaries as it was and to not interfere. In his long introduction to royal peace, Mahmud I qualified the Ottoman dynasty as possessing the great caliphate and himself as caliph on earth and imam of all people and as deserving to be called the commander of the faithful. The remarks of the Sultan and the Grand Vizier showed that the port considered Nadir's proposal as a challenge to the religio-political supremacy of the House of Osman in the Muslim world. Indeed, historical precedents demonstrated that Muslim rulers expressed their political challenges to the ruler possessing the Hijaz through outwardly pious initiatives in the holy cities and, holy cities and particularly in the Kaaba. Robert Olson aptly observed that Nadir's goals with his religious proposals were, in quotes, to establish his independence as a Muslim ruler and also to lay down a challenge to
to Istanbul's sovereignty, end of quote. The Ottoman responses clear, clarified that the Ottomans were not going to share their prerogative in the Hejaz with Nadir Shah, the first ruler of a newly born Sunni dynasty bordering the eastern frontier of the empire. Nadir's offer would have created a visible change in the Kaaba for the first time in centuries, which, which would have contributed to Nadir's transregional religious political legitimacy, posing a challenge to that of the Sultan. A Jaferi Rukn in the Kaaba would have declared Nadir's outstanding achievement of removing heresy from Iran and establishing Sunnism in Persia five times a day forever to Muslims from all around the world. Furthermore, it was highly likely that the Sunnis in the Hijaz and other parts of the Ottoman realm would have opposed such a radical change. In the end, this was an overnight change of sectarian identity after more than 200 years under the force of a severe ruler who adhered to Shiism until his coronation. By ac explicitly accepting Jaferism as a legitimate legal school and allocating a special corner in the Kaaba for his followers, the great caliph would have taken a major risk that could have harmed not only his own legitimacy, but also that of his dynasty. So now I move on to the escalation part. In the escalation period, several reciprocal embassies were exchanged between Istanbul and wherever Nadir was. <clears throat> During this period, Nadir sent five mission to the, missions to the Ottoman capital, two of which were returning Ottoman missions, and Mahmoud I sent two embassies to Nadir Shah. First, before waiting for the Ottoman response of 1736, Nadir Shah sent a mission to Istanbul and added two further stipulations to conclude peace. The ending of the fight between the Ottomans and the Russians and the approval of Russia of the peace between the Ottomans and the Persians. Nadir's introduction of the Russian conditions and insistence on the former proposals made it clear for the, for the port that Nadir was not to be satisfied with establishing authority within Iran. The port was fighting a difficult war against the Russo-Austrian alliance at that time, and Nadir kept rejecting to sign peace with the Ottoman Sultan. These were indi indicators that Nadir was not so inclined, inclined toward unity and peace with the great caliph as he pretended in his letters. Significantly, unlike the case in 1736, Nadir only sent a letter to Mahmoud I, not to the Grand Vizier, in 1737. Nadir maintained this diplomatic, st diplomatic stance indicating equality in rank between the Ottoman and Persian states until his death in 1747, even after the Treaty of Kadan in 1746. In response, the Ottoman Sultan wrote that the Ottoman fight in the name of Islam against the aggression of the infidel Russians was to continue. Certainly, the religious discourse was to counter and weaken Nadir's religious political discourse, which pressured the Ottoman Sultan to accept Jaferism due to religious unity between the Ottomans and the Iranians. The Sultan also reprimanded Nadir's reluctance to conclude peace with the Ottomans in indirect but strong words with reference to international law and diplomacy. Kawaid ve rusumu duel. The, the word, the phrase that uh, the Sultan used in the letter was that. <clears throat> Nadir wrote his direct response to the Ottoman reply to Jaferism offer and royal peace document after he has recently captured Kandahar and when he was on the way to conquer India. Ali Merdan Han, the Iranian envoy carrying the letter, died on his way to Istanbul, but the port still received Nadir's letter in August 1739. Nadir's letters had two main claims. First, yes. First, explicit recognition of Jaferism and the Rukn in the Kaaba were indispensable for the peace. Second, the Ottoman Sultan was the great caliph, thus 
he had complete authority to grant both of these religious demands. He qualified the Ottoman state as possessing supreme sultanate and great caliphate and the sultan as protector of Islam. Regarding the Jafarism question, he expressed that if it had pertained to either politics or economy, he would have solved it by himself without inconveniencing, inconven inconveniencing the shadow of God, i.e. Mahmud I. However, he added, this matter was within the power of the Sultan, given the religious and legal nature of the question. Nadir basically turned the great caliphate of the Sultan against him as an effective religious political weapon. He aimed to undermine the caliphate of the Sultan by challenging it not directly, by, but indirectly. Moreover, Nadir's qualification of his offer as religious as opposed to political or economic indicated at least two things. First, similar to the presentation of the Jafarism offer as an internal matter in 1736, Nadir maintained the same discourse that he had no political aim that could possibly threaten the Ottomans. Second, his audacious assertion <clears throat> that he would have solved the problem by himself if it, if it had been about politics or economics was a dangerous showing off of his political and economic might threatening the Ottoman Sultan. In a word, Nadir's insistence on the declaration of the recognition of Jafarism and establishment of the Rukn in the Kaaba verified for the, for the port that Nadir's real aim went beyond the internal reasons he had presented so far. Moreover, Mahmud I's Ahitnami Humayun became void as Nadir did not agree to make peace with the Sultan on these conditions. The port waited for the arrival of Haji Han, the envoy deploy, replacing Ali Merdan Han to respond to Nadir's letters. Nadir had written the letter after he conquered India in 1730s to 39. Now he styled himself as king of kings, Shahu Shahan, and sultan over the sultans of the earth, Sultan Berselatini Jihan, as struck on the new coins in India. The hutbah in Delhi on Eid al-Adha on March the 21st, 1739, was also read in his name. Now this letter to Mahmud I mostly boosted of his victory over the Mughal Muhammad Shah. He highlighted that with this victory, the well-protected domains of Persia now extend to the end of India and Indian Ocean. He briefly mentioned the Jafarism offer, clearly repeating his demand of the Sultan. His demand of the Sultan. In this letter, Nadir did not change his respectful language toward Mahmud I, whom the Persian Shah again called the possessor of the Great Caliphate several times with titles such as Evji Hilafet, Hilafet i Kubra, Azam Hilafet, the Sultanate Jihan Dari. The port replied to all the Persian letters carried by the missions of Ali Merdan Han and, and Haji Han. In total, six letters were sent to the Persian court with the mission of Munif and Nazir Efendis in June 1741. Two from Mahmud I to Nadir Shah, two from the Grand Vizier to the Itimad Devle, and two from the Shehiristan to the Itimad Devle again. These letters mark the categorical shift of the Ottoman position on Jafarism from implicit recognition to explicit rejection. While Nadir Shah gained victory in India and Central Asia, the Ottomans also defeated the Russo-Austrian alliance in 1739. Mahmud I responded to Nadir's boasting about his victory in India by describing the victory of the standard of the prophet i.e. the Ottomans, over the infidels without naming the Russians and the Austrians. The latter presumably underlined that the Ottomans had not fought against another Muslim state, e.g. the Mughals. The second letter from the Sultan dealt with the Jafarism question. Mahmud stated that the Ottoman state accepted three of the Nadir's proposals since they did not include any legal, political, or economic problems. He continued that the Ottoman state had been strictly bound by the Sharia from its birth to the present day. Thus, he added, they asked the ulama about these proposals and the ulama had unanimously agreed that 
religious law did not allow the acceptance of the Javeri legal school's legitimacy. Mahmoud's pointing to the ulama as the highest legal authority was a direct response to Nadi's claim that to accept his Jafarism proposal was within the authority of the great caliph. The Ottoman Sultan basically suggested that legal matters were beyond his legitimate authority as only the ulama had jurisdiction over the legal area. With this move, he warded off Nadir's turning of his caliphate against him. Mahmud's remarks also demonstrated a categorical change in the Ottoman approach to the legitimacy of the Jafari legal school. In 1736, the port had accepted Jafarism, though implicitly. In 1741, however, the Ottoman state explicitly rejected it on legal grounds. Critically, the port's precaution in implicitly accepting Jafarism at the beginning of negotiations enabled the Ottomans to transition to explicit, explicit rejection easily. Mahmud touched upon the political aspect of the proposal as well. The Sultan referred to verbal expressions used by the Persian ambassadors, who claimed that there were two reasons for Nadir's insistence on the proposals. First, they would be privileges for Nadir alone among rulers. Second, they would relieve Nadir of the burden and shame associated with, Iranians, with Iran's previous sect. These reasons capture again how a seemingly religious proposal was simultaneously political. They show also the incorrectness of Nadir's claim in his letter sent with Ali Merdan Han that the two, pro the two proposals pertained only to religion and not to politics or economics. They were, they were religio-political proposals from the outset. After underlining the political aspect of the proposal, Mahmud added that the granting of the ability to, ability to appoint a Persian Emir al-Hajj would suffice to meet to both of these need, needs, i.e. gaining privilege and relief from shame. The Sultan reasoned that neither a Muslim ruler today nor earlier Safavid Shahs had attained that privilege of appointing an Emir al-Hajj. Mahmud again clarified that it was not the port but religious law itself that did not allow the acceptance of Nadir's Jafarism proposals. That is why he concluded these proposals should be forgotten completely. Another important indicator of the firm Ottoman rejection of the Jafarism offer seems to have been the sending of the two envoys who were from the finance bureaucracy and not experts in religious law. Moreover, the letters of the Sultan and the Grand Vizier, although not that of the Sheikh Islam, did not name Jafarism explicitly. They always referred to it indirectly, as had been the continuing discursive attitude of the port since 1736, showing the Ottoman decisiveness on this matter. One of the two letters of the Sheikh Islam presented the legal justification for rejecting the Jafari legal school as a legitimate Sunni school in one major argument. Respectable books of the Hanifi school recognized only four legal schools belonging to Sunni doctrine. These books were full of references to, other, to the other three schools, i.e. Shafi, Hanbali, and Maliki, and distinguished the Hanifi legal weaves from the other schools on every legal matter. Apparently, there was no reference in these books to the legal views of the Jafari school. Approving a legal school as legitimate depended on the views of the imams of the legal school recorded explicitly in the respectable legal books. Thus, in the absence of views of Hanafi imams on Jafarism, the Hanafi ulema of today had no authority to accept that legal school as a legitimate Sunni school. The way the Sheikh Islam justified the Ottoman rejection aimed to close the door completely. When the great caliph pointed to the ulama as the authority on Jafarism proposal, the Ottoman ulama pointed to the great imams of the mazhab who had passed away centuries before and who had not, not granted their approval to the Jafari, Jafari legal school within Sunnism. It meant a deadlock for Nadir's highly desired religious proposal. Regarding the Jafari Rukn in the Kaaba, the Ottomans changed their reasoning there as well. 
Unlike the ease, indirect reason of Pesad given in 1736, the Sheikh Islam now boldly stated that Jaferism was not a valid legal school according to Sunnism and that there could not be a rukun in the Kaaba for an illegitimate, illegitimate school. All in all, <clears throat> Nadir's insistence on the explicit recognition of Jaferism and establishment of Rukun in the Kaaba convinced the port that Nadir's proposal posed a political challenge to the Ottomans. Istanbul thus abandoned its former position of implicitly recognizing Jaferism and rejecting the Rukun in the Kaaba with vague political and indirect legal excuses. Now, it rejected both of them with explicit and direct legal justifications in such a way that no room remained for Jaferism to be accepted. It was neither Mahmoud I nor the current Hanifi ulama, but the deceased great imams of Hanifism who could rule on this matter. In the letters of 1741, the port presented itself as if its earlier rejection was the same as what it now conveyed. From this point on, the Ottomans behaved as though they did not recognize Jaferism even explicitly. Modern scholarship has accepted the official Ottoman narrative in which they presented themselves as a sultanate that had rejected Jaferism offers from the beginning on legal grounds as the actual case. In the face of the categorical Ottoman rejection, Nadir Shah also categorically changed his insistence. Nadir sent Ottoman envoys of Munif and Nazif Efendis back from Dagestan with two epistles. Out of the two letters from Nadir in 1742, the Ottoman registrar of royal letters only includes one. In this letter, Nadir asked the Sultan to send two respectable ulama to Persia. These, these ulama and the Persian ulama would gather in the presence of Nadir. Nadir suggested that with his own interference, all disputed matters would be, would be solved and peace would be established. In contrast to the Ottomans, Nadir's official chroniclers included only the second letter in their works. In this second letter, Nadir demanded territories from the Ottoman domains, which he claimed he had inherited from Timur, unless the port accepted Jaferism. He named Iraq Arab, Diyarbakir, and parts of Azerbaijan, which are uh, corresponding to one and the surrounding territories in Kurdistan, as the inherited lands currently under Ottoman occupation. Nadir threatened the Ottomans with war by asserting that to solve the question completely, he would come to the Ottoman domains. He concluded his letter with a sarcastic threat. In quotes, I am hoping that if Allah wills, the matter may be arranged there on my arrival. End of the quote. Thus, Nadir pushed his demand further in all directions, both by demanding two Ottoman ulama and threatening the Ottomans with war. Around mid 1742, Nadir sent another letter to Ahmed Pasha, the governor of Baghdad, and repeated the same demand and threat. Either the port would accept the Jaferism proposals or Nadir would march on the Ottomans. Ironically, Nadir Shah still continued to recognize Mahmoud I as the great caliph in both of these letters. This clear inconsistency between discourse and action shows the importance of taking context in the account when analyzing diplomatic discourse. In this specific context, Nadir used the language of inferior not to show his obedience to the superior, but to undermine the power of the superior more effectively. That discourse would render the Sultan's position wrongful as Mahmud, the great Caliph, had wrongfully rejected the purely religious offer of a Muslim ruler who paid utmost respect to the Caliph and who aimed to do nothing but reconcile Muslim people divided for centuries. Now this discourse, could address several audiences, such as Ottoman subjects on the Eastern frontier, people from lower and higher classes in Istanbul, people of the Hijaz, Persian subjects, and so on. The port received a summary of Nadir's response in March 1742 from the report of Minif and Nazif Efendis a month before their arrival in Istanbul. 
regardless of Jafarism, Nadir's inheritance claim to Ottoman lands carried the crisis to a higher level, and the port sent war orders to several pashas as early as March 1742. The Shehiristan Sayyid Mustafa Efendi issued a fatwa declaring the legality of fighting against Nadir next month. Moreover, in line with the post-1738 policies of the port, the fatwa considered Jafarism to be a school within Shiism, which rendered its Sunnitization legally impossible. In addition, with references to heresy and abode of Islam in the fatwa, the port returned to its age-old religio-political discourse against the Iranians. Thus, for the first time since 1736, the Ottoman side showed that it would recognize the Persians as heretics as before. This was the Ottoman government's counter threat to Nadir's threats. Uh, not about four or five minutes? That's great. Okay. The Ottomans did not give up diplomacy completely, though. In his reply letter, Mahmud I stated that Nadir had demanded two further ulama to discuss the Jafarism proposal with sincere religious intentions. However, he added, as long as Nadir's aim was to establish affection and union between Muslims and to remove disunity, this fortunate aim would be achieved. Clearly, the Sultan was questioning Nadir's religious intentions. Then Mahmud wrote that in early Islamic history, there had only been this agreement on legal matters, Furu. however, these turned into doctrinal disagreements, Usul. This remark meant that even if problems in legal matters regarding Jafarism could be solved, it would not guarantee the solution of doctrinal problems per se. Mahmud added that those times were times of independent legal reasoning, Ijtihad, and the saved party, i.e. the Sunnis, had chosen unity, Ijtihad, in doctrine and four legal schools in legal jurisdiction. The Sultan basically repeated what the Shaykh Islam had written in his last epistles. Epistle, not to ulama of today, but earlier imams of the mezhab had exclusive right to accept or deny the legitimacy of a certain school. Both the Shaykh Islam and the Sultan referred implicitly to the famous post 10th century Sunni legal principle that the gate of independent legal reasoning was closed. To show that rulers were bound by the earlier ulama, Mahmud followed the next sentence with a carefully selected phrase. Rulers who were in the hands of those sects. Then he remarked that sending two ulama would be pointless and would only increase the conflict as there was no legal way for Jafarism to be accepted. He concluded that for the good order of both states, Nadir should give up his insistence on Jafarism. This letter closed the long period of diplomatic correspondence and negotiation that had started in 1736. So, to conclude, what primarily, <clears throat> what primarily created conflict between Nadir Shah and the Ottoman Sultan was not the legality of Jafarism according to Sunnism, but the visibility of Nadir's, Nadir's achievement in the corner of the Kaaba, the center of the Muslim world. When the former pertained to the internal aspect of the proposal, which the Ottomans consented to, the latter was about Nadir's external challenge to the House of Osman, which the port did not tolerate from the outset. It was for this reason, a seemingly scholarly conflict over a juristic proposal evolved into a major fight between the Ottomans and the Persians in 1743. However, both parties continued to maintain the political competition below the surface of a legal offer through a shared language. The shared legal and diplomatic language was not simply the, the arena upon which this rivalry took place. The symbolic use of words and arguments made political competition visible but did not remain only as symbols. They were the very things the rivals were fighting for in the Ottoman, Persian, and Arabic transregional sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and perfect timing. Um, a very rich and 
I'm sure that we have so much to um, talk about here. Um, Ferenc, why don't you start? And um, Mohamed, if you could just finish the sharing. Sure. Oh, perfect. Yes, so I, I have, I mean, I mean, I've, I have two related, tangentially related questions and one very small comment or suggestion. Uh, the, the suggestion is, I mean, I know you are struggling with, you know, how not to repeat words and <laughs> you form, when you write, but, you know, it doesn't sound well you, when you talk about, you know, them as the Persians. I mean, simply they were not Persians. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't think that we should use these, uh, you know, loaded categories uh, in, this, in this case. I, I know it's difficult okay. because there are just so many words to, to refer to these. So anyway, um, the other, the other more, impo more importantly, I mean, I was wondering, um, so Tucker, Ernst Tucker, I'm sure you are deep, more familiar with his work than myself, but he's, he's writing, uh, he, he writes that basically Nader had a kind of a, you know, they, he had, you know, he was playing a double game and he was basically saying different things to the Ottomans uh, I mean, things that, that were different from how he was going to sell this uh, project uh, on the home front, right? So, that, so I was wondering what your take on that is. Uh, and secondly, um, I, I mean, I see, I see in the, in, I mean, to the extent I'm familiar with this, uh, but I see in the literature uh, and I see also this in your talk, and maybe this is the way we should move forward but so i see this tendency of you know uh, very much a top down uh, uh, view of all this all, 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 all this not air uh, phenomenon and this is to a certain extent very much understandable because i mean on the one hand we are talking about diplomatic history and on the other hand many of of, of many uh, scholars uh, working on this uh, subject uh, have a set of an international relations uh, background of sorts so and basically, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there is the drive to, to sort of connect this to a broader diplomatic history, historical framework. So that's uh, quite understandable. But I was wondering if, if we can also, oh, if this on, on the part of Nader, what, what you take, I'm, I'm really interested in what your take on this. And so what is, is, is this uh, uh, attempt to say goodbye to Trevor Sheism? Is this uh, uh, only a project of Nader and his sort of central command, <laughs> central committee, uh, or, 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 or is, there, is, is it also sort of is there also sort of a social uh, uh, basis for this? Um, and, and yeah, I'm really interested in in this. Obviously, obviously, we do know that there are uh, con continuing. Obviously, there are Sunni elements uh, in, in the Safavid realm, but you know, um, I'm. I'm so the, the reason I'm saying this is because uh, uh, so I'm, I, I worked on a, on, a, on a text. It's a poetic text. Uh, it is from the time of, of Nader. It's in Turkish, and basically it's it's basically full of uh, didactic uh, uh, poems about you know how to pray in the in the in the, in the Shiite way, etc. So very basic stuff, right? Basic theology, basic uh, also practice rather. Uh, and, and, but before that, you have hardly any text that would talk about these as practical aspects of how to be a Shiite, right? In, in, in Turkic, that is directed to the, you know, former Kuzulbash uh, element uh, of Iranian society. So that's why I was wondering, I mean, you know, I mean, so that's why I'm asking if, if there is a broader, so do you think that there might be a broader social basis for, uh, so is there a broader social reception uh, of this uh, uh, goodbye to 12, 12 she's in project. So, <laughs> it was a long question, sorry. Oh, no, no, thank, thank you, thank you. These are great, great questions and uh, thank you for the suggestion as well uh, in the beginning. So, uh, Roy, may I uh, answer right now or should I wait for other questions? Um, actually, I think it would better if you answer now, but I just want to jump on top of one of uh, Ferenc's 
very important points. And, and that's something that I found fascinating in your talk is it's a political question that is discussed, at least part of it, in the language of religious authorities, or they kind of introduce themselves into the discussion and then they raise the, or, or you mentioned the um, position of the people of the Hejaz, if they are willing to see it even being. So th there is a tension here between some kind of political question, theological question, and uh, on top of the idea of, is it a top-down issue or is it a broader social affair? So if you can also address this point when, <laughs> sorry, he's overwhelmed, uh, I guess. <laughs> can, can, can you make your points a little bit more elaborate uh, or can you form them in, in, in a form of qu question? so that I can uh, get better and uh, respond uh, in a clearer way. You know what, and answer Ferenc and then I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> formulate it as a, as a okay. follow. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, first of all, Tucker's double game uh, argument. First, let me uh, say that I did not study the uh, internal Iranian aspect of the question uh, so much. So uh, I cannot in a position to judge whether it was really as Tucker uh, presents or not. But to me, it seems his overall framework uh, plausible. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Mohammed Ballan also um, made a presentation about this and uh, has a uh, workshop paper. He argues that actually what Nadir introduced is not, uh, is not something that can easily be, uh, be portrayed differently to different audiences. At the end, for example, you, uh, you remove Seb and you say that, no, you're not going to be called Shi'i, but Sunni. So the, he says that these are great changes and uh, you cannot just simply rule them out uh, and uh, you cannot ignore, uh, he says, and balance uh, critique of Tucker's double game uh, argument is that, and this, this also seems, uh, seems quite logical. But, uh, Again, overall, I agree with Tucker in the sense that this uh, proposal has two main uh, two main uh, ways. One is two main phases. One is internal, and the other is external. I I think that Nadir uh, has uh, seen this uh, proposal in this uh, from from this point viewpoint as well, because. Uh, we are not reading the mind of Nadir or, or somebody uh, in the uh, Iranian uh, palace at that time. They themselves clearly suggest that, no, it is only regarding the authority of Nadir within Persia, and it has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, uh, with territories beyond Persia. They, they, they themselves uh, uh, expressed this. So regarding the second question, the top-down view of Nadir phenomenon, actually, this is something that I also would like to uh, would like to learn more. Uh, it would have been great to to uh, to have more views on this, but I think that at least I argue in my uh, in my work that even the top-down part of the question is not understood well. Uh, so it is difficult to, to understand more delicate layers of the question without seeing the, uh, the, the general framework. Uh, for example, in my, my thesis also discussed heavily uh, the Ottoman and Afghan uh, confrontation in the 1720s. And your question can be more easily answered regarding that period because in the Ottoman realm, even in Istanbul, there were many people 
and even on, in the Ottoman army, there were many soldiers who were receptive of uh, Afghan Ashraf Shah's uh, call to them. And this case uh, is strikingly higher in the borderland, especially within, within the uh, Kur Kurdistan region. However, regarding Nadir's case, as, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the Ottoman uh, part in, uh, now. I don't, then there might be some, but Nadir's, uh, mem the memory of people regarding Nadir, by people I mean Ottoman Soviets, is not so good. So he was, uh, he um, co besieged Baghdad twice, and uh, he he killed many Ottoman pashas. So uh, many people's uh, subjects, not in the borders, but even in Erzurum, etc., suffered uh, from food, etc., uh, due to Nadir's uh, amazing marches and campaigns. So the image of Nadir uh, in in Ottoman uh, uh, among Ottoman subjects, I guess. Uh, was not as popular as Ash Ashraf Shah, for example. So I don't know this. However, having said this, uh, there, there are people uh, in the Ottoman uh, high circles who think that if, if uh, this goes to another war, if not accepting Nadir's uh, proposals, is going to end up with another war uh, and with a, a major misery, then let's accept it. Koja Ragab Pasha was uh, of this opinion, for example. Uh, so if uh, more research uh, will be, can be done on, on these uh, individual uh, views, I guess we can find uh, more uh, more views regarding the reception of Nadir's call. Uh, because, for example, even today, uh, modern scholarship, some of it at least, uh, discuss Nadir's uh, proposal only as a religious proposal as Nadir himself wanted to be seen. So it comes to mind that then is it, could it, it, it could also be possible that this same reception had occurred uh, back in time. So I, I, I think this, this could, it's a possibility. Uh, regarding the Iranian side, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, uh, I, uh, my, my thoughts could only be speculations and I don't want to <laughs> go into speculation. Speculation is a form of reflection, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Good talk, good, good talk, great talk. Thank you. Um. I have a long list of questions, but Amir, would you like to, because Nadir is so close to your heart? <laughs> That's exactly why I'm saving best for last. So I was hoping you'd go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a really, the story itself is, is absolutely fascinating. Why at this moment, after decades of peace, between the Safavid, the Safavids, the Shia Safavids and the Ottomans, we are deteriorating relationship when the sh strong Shia kind of content declines. So it's a very odd story of political tension that is translated into religious tension at a time where religious tension, tensions should have been eased in a way. Okay. So could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on this kind of complex political religious issue at this particular historical moment? Thank you. Actually, uh, this was the main question of my thesis. And, oh. uh, and I, I tried to answer this question, basically. So what, you have what, basically 300, word, uh, 300 pages of answer ready. Uh, so five, 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 five hundred actually. Unfortunately, oh, five hundred. <laughs> it's my bad. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, let let me try to uh, summarize the the main point. Mm. Um, 
uh, before summarizing, let me tell you that I argue that in the 20s, uh, in, in the 1720s, the Ottomans fought against the Afghan Ashraf Shah uh, to replace him with Prince Tahmasp uh, and to reestablish Safavid state. This, this was one of my arguments in my thesis. Second, uh, against Nadir Shah, the Ottomans uh, found uh, an imposter, Safavid prince called uh, Safi Mirza, uh, who who came to the Ottoman lands in the seventeenth uh, in in uh, in seventeen thirty. Uh, the Ottomans took him after thirteen years from Rhodes Island uh, and uh, sent him to the front against Nadir Shah, and uh, the aim of the Ottoman army was to re-establish Safavid state again uh, by, uh, by uh, taking down the Nad Nadir Shah. So it was very clear that Ottomans did not want a Sunni power, a Sunni dynasty uh, in their border in the east. <clears throat> My basic answer is that if we consider the, the big Ottoman territories, it, is, uh, it, it was encircled by religious, political, and environmental walls, and it creates an isolation for the House of Osman. Uh, and within this isolated realm, House of Osman enjoyed a monopoly of uh, legitimate rule. Uh, Geographically, the south was uh, closed by, -Sahar by Saharan Desert and Indian Ocean. So there was no challenging group or dynasty or authority. From the, in the west, it is the Christian Europeans. In the north, it, it was the uh, Russians. And in the east, it was the heretic Kazilbash. So if you, for example, want to raise Against the, against the uh, Ottoman Sultan from Cairo, from, from Alexandria, from Aleppo, from Crimea. The Sultan says that I am the legitimate ruler possessing the great caliphate due to the possession of uh, the Hijaz to holy sanctuaries. So you are uh, the uh, rebel, Bari in, in Fek language. So sometimes people say that, but this this is not by itself uh, is not sufficient, and I totally get this. Of course, this is this is not sufficient by itself to 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 maintain your authority uh, as the as the only legitimate ruler. However, it works as a soft power instrument. Uh, it basically the, the main point is that it's a soft power argument. You can uh, create a narrative. Uh, around this caliphate issue. And the, the main function of the caliphate is that a second ruler besides caliph is not legitimate. So you can enjoy your monopoly over this large territories uh, only by, uh, uh, you, you can enjoy your, your monopoly uh, without getting challenged by other uh, by other uh, dynasties. So what happened in 1722 uh, is the breakdown fall of the Shi'i Safavid wall that encircled and protected the Ottoman domains and the legitimacy of the House of Osman for centuries. Now uh, the Ottomans uh, are open. The, the House of Osman uh, cannot be easily cannot easily continue its uh, legitimate authority because there was now another alternative. Uh, and th 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 there were two main, two main uh, vulnerabilities of the, uh, of the Ottoman domains. First, the borderland, the Kurds and the Bedouin Arabs, uh, all, all, all the way from Georgia to Basra. And second, uh, the Sharif of Mecca. The Ottomans did not have uh, a, a clear 
uh, an unchallenged and unquestioned authority over the Sharif of Mecca. The, uh, uh, overall, uh, after all, the Ottomans did not conquer Hijaz. The Sharif of Mecca himself uh, submitted to the authority of the House of Osman. And Sharif of Mecca enjoyed a very semi-independent position. So if an alternative power can show him itself that it can protect Hijaz more effectively, that it can uh, provide the Hijaz in a more better way than the Ottomans did, then he can easily shift his position. And then you can see the, uh, the uh, retraction of Ottoman domains quite easily and uh, fascinatingly. The Ottomans could lose the Kurdistan era, the Basra, Baghdad, Hijaz, all at once. It, it was a possibility. Uh, when, 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 if you also think the technologies of war at that time, uh, the, uh, the power of the center over the periphery was quite weak. So uh, that's why I argue the Ottomans did not uh, want to have an, a possible alternative power uh, beyond their uh, frontier in the East. Fascinating way to frame this question. Um, and definitely neither did the Ottomans a very good service in India. So in that sense of knocking down any kind of competition from there. No, thank you for that. Um, Amir, it's just I'm aware of the time. And since you are the master of ceremony, um, um, there are, if we... even if there were hours of time, I think uh, there wouldn't be enough time. I feel like uh, me and Habib should have like our own like two man conference where we just <laughs> dedicate the rest of the day. But yeah. we will definitely have to discuss because especially with what uh, Ferenc raised on the internal and domestic issues speaking to this relationship. Um, there are so many things that uh, I would like to discuss with you on how internal state formation under Nader is influencing the discourse on are we Jafari Shi'i or are we Jafari Sunni? How he's kind of inflecting it very differently to different audiences in order to kind of maximize his legitimacy. Even the Council of Najaf is a very good example of this. But um, yeah, as I said, the questions that I have rattling around my mind, uh, we're going to have to leave that for a proper discussion. It's not going to be, you know, one or two questions. That, so, that will be my pleasure. Yeah. We should move on to uh, our next speaker. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much for this fascinating paper and, and uh, uh, no less fascinating discussion. Um, and it is exciting to find the, the two people who care about Nader at the same uh, time, <laughs> the same place. Uh, no, I'm very excited yeah. about the next paper because uh, we are looking towards south asia where i am based um uh, so Saida, please um if you could I'll, I'll give you the stage now what happened so we we lost you for a second so if you can start yeah sorry the connection was got i got cut um yeah um okay, perfect so sorry. please go ahead Share my screen. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being uh, here now uh, to listen to my presentation. I might be disappointing you because um, unlike other speakers since yesterday who had like more historical analytic approach, mine is more of um, literary, philosophical or theological nature. I'm coming from the background of philosophy of religion. But the good news is I'm not going to talk about all those boring philosophical issues. I'm, I'm more going to recite poetry to you and uh, 
have you um because i know you're already tired so we we'll have we're going to more have um static pleasure than anything else like more intellectual um i'm going uh to introduce um to um um I lost yeah to uh, Muslim poets um, around the turn of the 20th century um, who responded to this the socio-political situation that we're in almost in the same manner um, the first one is Muhammad Iqbal uh, the Pakistani national poet so uh, these two figures are very important in their own cultures and countries um, Iqbal is also regarded as a spiritual father of Pakistan, the one who had the idea of an independent Muslim country. Um, but at the time when he composed this poem, um, there was no Pakistan, it was India. So Indian, I don't know, slash Pakistani poet. Uh, in his poem, Shikva, complaint in 1911, composed in 19, or published in 1911. And the second a piece of poem is by Mahmoud Akif Ersoy. He is also a very important in Turkey, regarded as the Turkish national poem, poet. Um, uh, in his, and, and, and the, po uh, the piece of poem of his, who, which I'm going to introduce is um, titled Ya Rabbu Suzgijanin Yok Musabahu. Translated, Oh God, is there no dawn to this uh, ominous night? Composed in 1913 or published in 1930. Um, what is strikingly interesting in these two pieces of work, which I uh, found, um, is uh, the motive they use, um, both of them use, and the way they react to the calamities of time, uh, their time. Just to remind, um, you um, of the historical uh, background against um, which they uh, composed these poems. It was like the time when Islam was in decline, the Ottoman Empire was losing um, territories uh, to, to, to the enemy, like uh, the Western Christians. Um, Islam is losing its glory, not just that, uh, like wars are, are all around the Muslim world, Muslim countries, some of Muslim countries are colonized. There is war and bloodshed everywhere. Innocent people die, are killed, like hundreds and thousands of them every day. So this is the setting. And faced with this, um, this much of pain and suffering, these two poets respond, unlike uh, what is... Um, what is um, normal in the Muslim tradition, not with patience and forbearance uh, and accepting their, uh, their destiny, but, all, but with um, complaint and, and beyond that with, uh, with rebelling and, uh, and protesting against God. So this makes their works um, in my eyes unique. And again, I said I'm coming from a philosophical, like theological background with a huge interest in world literature and languages. So this is more of this nature than historical or analytical. So what I detected with this, in these two pieces of poem was the motive of the pious rebel or the rebellious pious. And what do I mean by that? The pious rebel is, is a believing person, in this case, a believing Muslim, who does not abandon the belief in God or his or her love for God, nor does he or she accept it with forbearance and patience, but rather rebels and accuses God while remaining loyal and loving him or her, loyal to and loving him or her. So unlike the atheist who faced with like, or a believer faced with suffering um, who abandons faith, um, a pious rebel does not abandon faith, uh, keeps um, his belief and faith and love for God, but still um, does not accept the status quo and rebels and does not see anything beautiful in all this pain and suffering and does not accept his or her destiny and um, protests against God. Um, in the context uh, of uh, such, uh, in the context where these pious rebels appear, one can observe that humans show that they can raise themselves above God, that humans could surpass God in their morality, reminding God of the divine justice and divine duties in respect to his or her creation. If you would ask what is so special about that, um, um, I should um, I should mention certain preliminary points in order to 
make the case more clear. So I here I raise two questions and in response to these questions, then my point would get clear and you would see why uh, these um, the similarities between these two pieces of work are um, extraordinarily interesting. Um, so the first question, what is so special about this motive? And second is where could this motive be traced? Um, in response to the first question, um, um, what, what is so special about this motive, I should very, very briefly um, mention what was or what is to this day the Islamic traditional response to the problem of evil, which is called, uh, like the responses they give um, are um, classified under the uh, rubric of theodicy. Theodicy is any attempt by any religious or non-religious tradition to justify the existence of evil uh, in the world or justify God in the face of evil. Um, so the Quranic response usually um, given by the scholars to the problem of evil is, um, according to the Quran, the response is, it's either test or trial or warning or for the purpose of soul making or spiritual growth or punishment. So um, evil is instrumental is, uh, and um, for, for a greater good. And um, it is in fact no evil, it, it serves greater goods. Um, the, and uh, Islamic uh, theologians, philosophers, uh, finding the Quranic response not systematically enough or convincing enough provided also their own responses, which I list here very briefly. It's just a huge discussion, but I just briefly list here. Evil is caused by human free choice. This actual world is the best possible world attributed to Al-Ghazali. Evil is necessary for the existence of the material world. Evil is a privation of good, absence of good, and hence has no actual existence. Reward in the afterlife outweighs this worldly pain and suffering. Evil is a means to greater good. So you can see what Every response they give, one thing is for sure, evil does not exist. Evil is what we regard and assume as evil is not actually evil because it is an instrument for, for, for a purpose, for a key loss, and therefore it is good. So no recognition of the existence of genuine evil, let alone providing any room for objection, complaint, or protest. Um, going to the Sufi tradition, um, one would expect to get another, like a, another response that would be more existential, more giving more, um, like providing more room for human uh, complaint, but it's not the case. It is even worse. Sufis glorify suffering. Based on the Quran, um, the Quranic narrative that offers ample examples of what it means to be Muslim, literally resigned, completely surrendering, surrendering oneself, heart and body to God in a state of pe uh, perfect trust. They say um, that like, suffer, uh, like suffering is, is, uh, is uh, like they, they go again to that uh, idea that suffering is for spiritual growth and for uh, soul making. So this led to the frequent idea that distress is a sign of divine favor as a ascetical view, which became widespread in some Sufi mysticism, which often identified the highest degree of spiritual accomplishment with the virtue of Rida, satisfaction with a divine decree. As a result, the saint open-heartedly and without hesitation accepts tribulations simply because they are from the God whom he or she loves. This is regularly encountered in the Sufi literature. Life with all its hardships is divine gift in itself. So again, um, accepting um, pain and suffering with open arms. So I come to the second question. So the first question was, what is so special about this motive? What is special about this motive is you cannot find a trace of it in the Islamic tradition. Um, the second question is then how can we find the traces of it? Um, how can we tra trace it back? Where does, it dis where does this motive come from? According to Navid Karmani uh, in his book, The Schrecken Gottes, or in English, The Terror of God, with the subtitle Atar, Job, and the Metaphysical Revolt, which was published in 2005 and recently also translated into English, um, one can find this motive in Attar's rebelling fools. So Farid, uh, Farid Din Attar 
13th century Persian poet and mystic, according to Navid Karmani, in all his works, but especially in the Book of Suffering or Musibat Nome, gives um, like uh, introduces this motive of rebelling fools who uh, rebel against God, but they are fools. Uh, so in response to the question, how can suffering and injustice be reconciled with the idea of good, loving, all-powerful, and all-knowing God, which is called a problem of evil, um, Attar's rebelling fool's answer with revolt, revolt against God, quarreling by and by quarreling with God. And this is epitomized in the figure of Job in the Bible, according to um, Navid Kermani. And just to um, remind you that the Quranic Bible, unlike the biblical Bible, uh, biblical Job, the Quranic Job, unlike the biblical Job, does not protest accepts all the suffering and pain granted to him by God until the end with patience and with sabr and forbearance um, accepts what, whatever um, comes over him. So Navid Kamani argues, right, it is true this biblical um, job, this biblical job motive could not be found neither in the Quran nor in the Islamic tradition, whether philosophy or theology or Sufism, but it could be found in Attar's works, especially in Musibat Nama. So I, um, I brought a quote from the book um, about the job motive. Um, clinging to God, but simultaneously denying him the attribute of goodness, and finally the rewarding of this negative emotion towards God, these are all elements of the Job motive, which is precisely not constituted by mere accusation or mere forbearance. The motive can be found in all of Attar's verse epics, though in an ex uh, extremely pessimistic variation in the Book of Suffering, for here the poet describes suffering and the consequent rebellion more drastically than any other work of Islamic literature. So it's, um, Attar in this is really unique, according to Navid Karmani. And what is interesting is, um, in all the responses given to the problem of evil in the Islamic tradition, you see this this optimism, this rather naive optimism that the world is the best possible world, uh, the end is going to be well, so the, all the evil and suffering in the world is justified. But in the Book of Suffering, the uh, dominating uh, mode and tone is very pessimistic and very dark. Um, and of course, um, Attar was not the first one who introduced the idea of these uh, fools, um, these rebelling fools. Um, it has its, its history, the Islamic tradition, in the image of the wise fools or Ohala al Majanin in Arabic or Khalat Mandona Divane in Persian. Um, they already exist in the Islamic tradition, and, um, and then, uh, Attar is familiar with them. They were um, mystics, these Ohala al Majanin, who acted against social norms, defied the Sharia, questioned the religious authorities but also question the political rule. And um, in order um, to protect themselves from the accusation of, of heresy or anything, um, they pretended, they, they played the fool, they pretended to be insane. So under the guise of insanity, they could question everything from the religious authorities to political rule and uh, at the same time, uh, ref um, like refuse from following the Sharia. Um, so this was like a motive already there, and Attar was um, aware of that. But what is unique about Attar's fools is that they question not only the religious authorities and the political rule, but also God. They criticize not only the social injustice, but also divine justice. Unlike atheists, they refuse to deny the existence of God in the face of pain and suffering, um, or turn away from him or her. They believe in God, but refuse to accept the creator world as it is. So um, this is um, what is called like quarreling, the motive of quarreling with God. Um, and Navid Karmani mentions that this idea of quarreling with God, again, is not um, without its traces in the Islamic tradition. Quarreling with God was especially widespread among the poets of the Turkish 
Bakhtashi order, the Anatolian mystic and poet Yunus Emre, who is immersely popular to this day, criticized the, C the Sirat bridge, which all the dead had to cross, even though it is finer than a hair. And he also disapproved of the scales with which God weighs up the good and bad deeds of humans. A bridge, Yunus said, is built for people to cross it, not to, uh, to fall down. Scales are fit for a grocer, but not for a god. A different Bakhtashi dervish, Khaigusuz Abdul, said, you've built a bridge from her so that your, servants, your servant comes and walks across it. We want to stay where we are. And if you are here, O oh God, then walk across it yourself. Um, this is in the, in the, in the uh, Sufi tradition. And as one of the speakers yesterday um, duly mentioned, in Yunus Amra was influenced by the Persian mystics. So it is very much possible this, that this motive found its way in Anatolia through uh, Yunus Amra, and this is very much um, the motive of uh, the motive we can find in Attar's works. Um, outside of mysticism, we can also find the traces of this motive of quarreling with God. Doubts about the justice of God's actions run through the entire poetry of Arab Persian culture. Al Ma'ari, Daqiqi, Umar Khayyam, to name some. Uh, which are all Persian, and Ibn Rawandi, the Arab poet. But what is um, clear about them, they are atheists. So they are just like some of them are accused of being atheists, that some of them, them like, like Omar Khayyam, some of them openly said that they were atheists, like, um, like Al Ra um, Ibn Rawandi and um, Al Ma'ari. So this is no surprise to see them, that, um, to see them question God and question his or her justice. Um, but as for the for the uh, for the mystics, in fact, they are questioning God. Apparently, they are questioning God. But what they are questioning is the ulama's conception and understanding of the uh, of the day of judgment. So they are not questioning God and divine justice, but rather again the ulama, even if apparently they are questioning God. So again, as um, Kermani says, and I agree with him, this heretical piety is unique. To Musibat Name. It seems to me, however, I'm quoting Kermani, that the Book of Suffering still constitutes the most violent outburst of heretical piety within this Islamic cultural realm. There is probably no other Islamic text in which Job's motives are as central and as varied. Here, mean, here what he means is the biblical Job, of course, um, as in the Book of Suffering. The motive of cursing existence, suffering from death after a long life, but above all, the turn against God in hardship and the appeal finally to keep the promises he has made to humans. So if we take Kermani's, um, um, accept Kermani's um, claim, then this is a kind of what, what is suggested in the Book of Suffering is a kind of protest theology or protest theodicy or anti-theodicy, anti-theology. And, and um, this is a movement that started especially after the Second World War. And uh, the advocates of this movement were um, Jews who directly or indirectly experienced um, the Shoah. Um, and, but also there are some Christians amongst them. Um, who suggested this idea of proto-theodicy or theology. According to them, God is not all good. So they question the omnibelevance of God. God is all powerful and all knowing, but not all good. Uh, so like Job, they say, we should keep prote uh, protesting and rebelling till we draw the attention and favor of the divine towards us. So the idea is, as in the in the book of Job, in the Bible, and many other cases, um, God is like this all-powerful king, this sovereign king who has who can do whatsoever he wants, um, and he is just unmindful of his created world, of his creatures, and we should keep protesting and rebelling until we can draw his attention towards us and um, to make it clear to him um, that he is acting unjustly. So this being said, now I come to these two pieces of poetry. In these two pieces of poetry, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, I could find the same motive, um, that is the motive of the rebelling pious or the pious rebel, or this, this is the motive of a quarreling pious, rebelling pious, whatever you want to call it, the motive the, of the biblical Job present in these two pieces of poem. And 
as it has come clear, the reason why it is strikingly interesting is that this is not at all the normal response a Muslim, a believing Muslim, a pious Muslim would give to the problem of suffering and pain. Um, I would read also the uh, the poems. Of course, it is not all all the po uh, like all the verses of the of these poems. Just uh, I, I selected some just some few verses in order to give you the the impression of how it is like. Um, I will also read them in the original language because um, the words and the melody used in these poems are instrumental to convey uh, this mode of protest and and um, rebellion. Um, so, since the form is also at the service of the content, I also I will recite them in the original and then translate them. The translations are mine. Amongst you are those who know Urdu and Turkish, so if they're wrong, please correct me, because the translations I found for Shikva, I didn't like. For um, Akifar Soy's poem, I couldn't find at all any English translation online, maybe in Turkey there are in libraries, but online um, and in Germany, I couldn't get any, any, any translation. So these are mine's, uh, my translation, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So um, in Shikva complaint, Muhammad Iqbal, who is also a very important philosopher himself, so he's a poet philosopher, um, starts, um, starts saying, like depicting how the situation is in the Muslim world um, and um, imagines a garden, the garden of Islam, which is now withering away, it is uh, the trees are turning uh, yellow and uh, and dead, um, and the garden is abandoned. Um, and he is like this bulbul, like this um, what is bulbul? <laughs> this um, uh, nightingale, which is sitting in the in the midst of this uh, this garden and is complaining to God. So I start. Jora Tamuz Meri Tabe Sukhanhe Mochko, Shikva Allah Sechakam Betahanhe Mochko. The strength of my words is encouraging to me, who to me, my complaint is against God. So the word he's using is Chakam Betahan. Um, those who know Urdu and Persian, this is like, they can understand it is stronger than who to me. It's like, may, may dust be into my mouth. I, how do I dare to say that? But I'm saying that I'm, my complaint is against God. Oh God, listen to the complaint also from the faithful to you. Listen to some complaints also from the one accustomed to praise you. And then he depicts the, um, the scene, how the situation is, that Islam is um, losing its glory, that Muslims, um, like the Tawheed is... Um, is um, going lost in this world, and instead the cross is getting power, the ringing bells of the churches are now heard, and after that, as if God is not aware of all this, um, he says, <laughs> Infidelity is mocking, do you have some feeling or not? Do you have any regard for your own tawhid or not? And then um, he goes on reminding God of all the services Muslims have given um, to God all throughout the Muslim history and uh, like reproaching God, reminding God that if it were not for Muslims, your message of Tawheed would not be spread in the world. If it was not for Muslims, um, nobody would have known about you, etc., etc. So this is uh, where he says, um, so reproaching God says, he says, how strange was the sight of your world before us. Here the stone was adored, there the tree worshipped. The human eyes being accustomed just to what they could see, how could they ever be amenable to accept the God they could not see? Are you aware of, at all? So this Tochko Malum is very strong to my ears, but do you, are, you, are you aware at all? Can you really, can't you really realize uh, who was the one who raised your name? It was the strength of Muslims' arm that did the service to you.
And then again, reproaching God goes on. Konsi qom fagat teli tarab kar hoyi, or teri li zahmat kisha pay kar hoyi. Kiske shamshi jahangi jahandar hoyi. Kiske takbir se dunya teri idar hoyi. Kiske hey bat se sanam sahme hoyi rahte te. Munke balgar ho gar ke ho Allahu ahad kahte te. Which nation did become exclusively the seeker of you and became embroiled in war's calamities for you? Whose world conquering sword did world ruler become? By whose takbir did your sword and lion become? Through whose fear idols did perpetually remain alarmed, falling on their faces, saying, Hu Allah, hu ahad. So alluding to the Quranic verse, Qul hu Allah, hu ahad. So he goes on saying, like, if it were for Muslims, all the idols would remain on earth. We turned the idols down and had them um, shout, ahad. And so just reproaching God and just reminding God of all the services as if God is not aware of them all. So you see this motive of, of this rebelling pious who um, turns um, also in anti theodicy mentioned in this motive um, of Job, um, hum like this pious rebel turns towards God and as if this this all-powerful king unmindfully is ignoring his servants, reminds him of all the services and reminds him that he should now give the services back. And then um, when he goes on it, the, the poem takes a very interesting turn where we see that uh, now Iqbal plays the role of the jealous and, and passionate lover who is said that um, his beloved is now abandoning the garden, the garden of Islam, uh, or all Muslims as these passionate lovers um, are sad that this beloved is now turning towards other lovers and abandoning their garden, going to another garden. Um, and says, Kebi Hamse, Kebi Gairun se shanasa ihe, ba kehne ki nehi tu bitu harjai ihe. Well, the word harjai is a very strong word. Um, I don't know what um, connotations this word had um, at, at a time when uh, Iqbal uh, composed this poem, but there's a Persian word which means the person who is everywhere. And um, in Urdu dictionaries, uh, as I checked, um, it means both unfaithful, so normally unfaithful, as it is in, in Ottoman Turkish and also in, Turkey to, in Turkish today, that harjai means simply unfaithful. Um, so it's not so strong a word, but it also mean, can mean prostitute. So to, to address God in such a language is, is very strong. Um, so he's playing this jealous and passionate poet, uh, lover who is mad as, at his uh, beloved uh, who left him alone. Um, but after this rage and anger in Farsi, he turns and says, Oh, that happy day when you with elegance will come back, when you unveil to our congregation will come back. Well, Iqbal knew very well about Persian poetry. Most of his poems, like 70% of his poems are in Persian. He, he wrote both in Persian and in, um, in Urdu. Um, his uh, major work, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, um, is very much influenced by the Iranian thinkers because his PhD was um, on the development of thought in, in Persia. So um, he oftentimes quotes um, different Persian poets, Attar he doesn't quote, but um, he's very much influenced by Maulana and he regards um, Rumi as his um, guide in in one of his books, um, like Dante's um, Virgil, leading, uh, guiding him towards um, the heavens. So um, the probability is is there that he was very much uh, familiar with this uh, motif uh, found in Attar's poetry uh, because he he mastered the Persian literature. So this being Shekva, now I go to the to the second poem by Mahmoud Akif Arsoy. Um, with the title Yara Bursus Gen Yuk Musabahu. Already from the title, you can you can guess that um, the tone will be rebellious and, and the atmosphere is very pessimistic and dark. Um, o oh Lord, is there no dawn to this ominous night? Is is the third title and the first verse. Um, so it goes. 
Ya Rab uğursuz gecenin yok mu sabahı? Mahşerde mi biçarelerin yoksa felahı? Nur istiyoruz, sen bize yangın veriyorsun. Yandık diyoruz, boğmaya kan gönderiyorsun. O Lord, is there, is there no dawn to this ominous night? Does the deliverance of the miserable come no earlier than the day of resurrection or the day of judgment? We yearn for light, but you grant us burning fire. We are burning, we yell. You pour floods of blood upon us to drown. And then again, he too goes on depicting the situation of um, the Muslim world, the misery that, that the kofr or, or uh, infidelity is rising, Islam is, is declining, um, the message of Tawhid is getting lost, etc. And again, as if God is not aware of that, he turns to God and says, Islam ayya kalkun da sürün sun mini hayat, ya Rabbu ne husrandır ilahi, bu ne zillet, mezdumu nedir ezmede ezdirmede mana, zalimleri adlin, hani öldürmede hala, canı geziyor diptir, can vermede masum, suç başkasınındır da, niçin başkası mahkum? Um, should Islam be eventually downtrodden and dragged around, or oh God, what loss is it, and what degradation? And again, here openly and closely questioning the divine justice says, what is the point in crushing and destroying the oppressed? Why didn't your justice instead annihilate the oppressor? As you remember, again, in that motive, it was humans position themselves above God and show that in morality, they can, they can, they can be higher than God or God's. Um, and then he goes on, the perpetrator is kept alive while the innocent is dying. The sin belongs to someone else while someone else is paying, as if God is not aware of all these in injustice. La yus ala biller de sualu sada qurban, insan bu muamma olara dehşetle nigehban. Many questions are silenced by you cannot question. Um, this la yus ala, um, la yus ala is, is, is an allusion to the Quranic verse that says, la yus ala, um, he cannot be questioned about what he does, but they will be questioned. So it's like any time you ask questions, you silence us with uh, you cannot be uh, you cannot question me or he that is God cannot be questioned. So humans should always uh, quietly accept whatever happens to them, and they are always silenced. Human human faces these mysteries with terror. So um, you can see that. Um, the, in the title of Navid Kermani's book, it was also Terror of God. His idea is that in, um, in Attar's book, uh, the figures, what they feel when they encounter the divine is mostly fear and terror um, and no awe or admiration or, or, or beauty. So God is for them absolute terror. Um, and the world is also nothing but beauty, but uh, terror um, arousing or something. Um, and then uh, Mahmoud Akaf Arso goes on, like again, uh, talking about the situation of the Muslim world, and then says, Madam, ke adli lahi yakajaktun, yaksaydun amal undar, tuttum bizi yaktun. Oh, you divine justice, if you wanted to burn, you should have burned the evildoers, but instead you picked up us to burn. Yet must, and, and, and then he ends his poem with this brilliant verse, which is again putting a question mark in the divine justice. Yet mas mumsa boldu mus bunja davahi azun kursun yok musun ay adli lahi. Is it not enough all the calamity you went through? Woe to me. Azun kursun is again like that um, that phrase Akbal used, like may my mouth uh, turn dry. Um, that's woe to me, but. Don't you exist, you the divine justice. So as as uh, you know, the the biggest, uh, like the most important divine attribute in Islamic tradition, especially in the Shia tradition, is divine justice. And uh, uh, Muhammad Akifar so very beautifully questions this divine justice, which is um, one of the elements of the motive, this motive of the rebelling pious that I mentioned at the beginning. So I end the conclusion 
It's strikingly interesting to observe that the motive of the pious rebel suggested by the Persian poet and mystic Attar could be found in the poems of two of the modern Muslim poets from two different corners of the Muslim world, one in Turkish and one in Urdu. Considering the fact that Attar's pious rebels and their metaphysical revolt remain unique and without likeness in the Muslim tradition, the presence of this motive in those two modern Muslim poetic pieces gains more importance. This motive might be a traveling motive that found its way from the Persian mystic poetry to the different corners of the turco tajik world. However, this hypothesis needs further studies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed very pleasing aesthetically, beautiful things and uh, beautiful translations. So thank you for sharing these with us. Um, May I ask you just to stop the share so that we can... I, yeah, but I have no idea how it works. <laughs> Go to the share screen. Yeah, but I lost the share screen. I don't know what it, where it is. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share and then I can... So I'll be a bit brutal about it and then I can stop sharing. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> It work. Uh, okay. Um, oh, perfect. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, first of all, we have already a question in the chat. Uh, can you expand on the concept of suffering as part of faith enlightenment? I don't get the question. Um, could the faith enlightenment? the person, faith and enlightenment. Could the person who asked the question, I just, I see only letters, so I don't know who that is. Can you please elaborate? I think we can circle back to that question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ferry, please. Um. It's a, sort of a broad question. Just a very small comment first. You might, maybe you want to check the dates of, of Kaigus Abdel. I think there was a late 9th, 14th century. I think he died in the mid 15th century. Okay. But you should check. So, well, in any um, case. It was just more, a direct quotation from the book, but thanks for the hint. It's all right. Uh, um, so, so it was. Um, now, I was wondering, I mean, there is this uh, uh, reading of yours uh, regarding suffering, which uh, I think is, is, follows a kind of a Bakhtinian uh, pattern that is uh, sort of the questioning of, of the, the order uh, by some certain uh, uh, sort of uh, antinomian elements, like, uh, like Sufis. Uh, uh, so Bakhtin was talking about laughter and and uh, we, 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 in the poetry of Rabelais, uh, and so oh, sorry. So I was uh, wondering if uh, uh, if we can also read the the this kind of uh, attitude as as um, not nece not necessarily you know it's not just you know not just a questioning of 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 the uh, of the divine order, or, or that is the order of society, but also actually uh, a, a, a statement or an assertion of that uh, order. Mm -hmm. so that would be that would be a question. Um, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure if I got your question right, but. Um... So basically, you know, when, when questioning the fundamental fundamentals of something, you might at the same time you also you are asserting that that would be the right thing. Uh, yeah, wh what is this fundamental something? Well, the divine order. So this to see this divine God's order. God's, God's justice, so God's uh, goodness, right? So when you when you questioning when you are questioning it, uh, uh, 
so it is you know the question is is this a kind of revolt or is it is it actually a, 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 a call for uh, the confirmation uh, uh, of the divine order No, um, yeah. So the question is: Is it is it a, a, a fruitful way of you know a way of thinking about this? Well, um, the, the the point is like um, of course it's more a, a discussion that is discussed in the in the context of philosophy of religion that the minute you say God is absolutely good and everything is good in whatever he or she does, then you are not rec recognizing the existence of evil. And if you want to recognize the existence of genuine evil, and you want to fight against it, you either should say God is either not omnipotent or omniscient or is not good. And uh, there are many such responses. There are also uh, responses given to the problem of evil, assuming that God is limited in power and in knowledge. Um, so that the, these two propositions, God, uh, an omnipotent, omnipotent uh, omniscient, good God exists, evil exists, Traditionally, they would say evil does not exist. Um, th this God with these attributes exists. Uh, but if you want to accept the existence of evil, genuine evil, then you have to think about these divine attributes. E either you have to limit the divine power or no and knowledge, or you have to um, say God is not good and merciful, etc. Whether that's fruitful or not, in, in some way it's fruitful because then it in the first step to act against the evil and, and suffering in the world is to accept its existence. So very much the, the, the approach of the classical um, Slavic responses is very escapist. It's just, there is no evil. We deny it, problem solved, whereas it, it really exists. And, and there is a silence also. So this could be instrumental for oppressors to oppress oppressed even more saying like you shouldn't um, object this is a divine decree you should accept so even the sultans can also argue it this way and they did so if you want to question the the, the earthly authority you should first question the divine authority i would say um, and this is what uh, anti-theology or theodicy suggests and the you know i i hope i could respond to your question Um, thanks. Amir? Yes, um, I would like to uh, ask you about the intellectual heritage of this movement, um, specifically with regard to the idea of being in pain and that as a road to express discontentment uh, against God. Did they speak to Rumi at all, because it really smacked of some parts of Rumi's poetry, especially when I think back to Bishnoi Ney, Asjadoya, Hekayatim Konat. There's so much that this movement could draw from that uh, kind of corpus of literature by Rumi. Did they acknowledge him, or was it mostly uh, Atar that was first and foremost uh, in their minds? Um, I, I wouldn't say so, so whether this motive could also be in, found in Rumi, I doubt. For Rumi, um, problem of, uh, pain and suffering in the world is instrumental for, for again, soul making, growth, spiritual growth, etc. So even when there are many poets like Rumi um, longing to go back to their origin, but it's more like... Um, like out of their love, their divine, the love they have for the divine, etc. So this motive of a rebelling uh, pious, you can by no means, I would say, find in, in Rumi is a more, um, yeah, Erfone B. so it's like more based on the idea of God as beauty and love, so this uh, neoplatonic idea. I see. Okay, come up, please. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> and thank, thank you, Saida, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really lovely to uh, hear all the uh, verses. Uh, just, and I also uh, just admire how you navigate uh, between uh, languages. It, it was fascinating. <laughs> uh, 
it, it's it's great. One thing we got about the uh, Ottoman version of the Mehmet Akif's uh, uh, verse, there was it was just a, something quite minor, but I just uh, say this: it might be there might be some other uh, mistakes also in, in typing. So it, it will be better for you just to check uh, before publication. Uh, there was a omel umlar. There was, there was a word, omel umlar, and it was written only with elif instead of elif and vav. Uh, so vav is missing and you can just check the other uh, verses as well. My question uh, is, so you make a comparison between past and today. Uh, and in the past, you look at pain and suffering in the individual, uh, taking the individual as the unit of analysis, individual pain, individual suffering. And Iqbal and Akif from the, uh, from the modern world, but uh, their suffering or pain is not individual, but communal, uh, communal tragedies or, or uh, sufferings. So, for example, did you did you see examples of similar uh, communal sufferings and expression of them in in in, in literature? Let's say during the uh, invasion of Mongols uh, to to the uh, Islamic lands or or any other time. I I I, I don't know, uh, and I don't know, but I I thought that to make a comparison between more similar sufferings could be uh, 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 a more, uh, I have to say, uh, could make more sense uh, in understanding the relationship between past and today uh, in, in literature. But I'm, I'm very... Uh, far from the study of literature and uh, and so on so uh, I, I may be uh, I'm totally uh, losing a point and thank you again um, you're welcome thanks for your question but I would say like um, I should object because because you said like um, the pain and suffering Attar is talking about is uh, individual whereas Akif Arsoy and Iqbal's um, uh, pain and suffering felt pain and suffering um, are collective, uh, which is not the case. Like in the case of Attar, it was the same thing. Uh, there were some wars, um, like Kermani, like around 30 pages, this talks about the background, uh, the historical background. There were wars um, happening. And um, there was also news of um, the Mongols attacking the Muslim lands. It's what Kermani claims that Attar was aware of. So it was like a setting um, where uh, like, pain and suffering is, is like collective pain and suffering is is um, in the society present and um, Atar also gives many examples of the cases of a person like many poor people who turn towards God and ask for their rizq, for their bread, uh, daily bread and um, because like uh, famine and hunger is rampant and then in response God uh, is just silent and, and then this beggar uh, goes to the to the mosque and um, crushes the window saying if if you get, don't give me bread i would do this and that so it's just he the, in in many of, of the uh, examples that attar brings in there are um present um like cases of collective suffer, collective suffering so it's not at all personal and if it, if, if it were individual suffering it would if would be rather very modern because like existential suffering, this individual suffering that I'm suffering and God is silent. This is very much modern. It is not at all um, pre-modern. So for Atar, it's also the collective suffering. And in, in the case of other mystics, it is just, yes, they are all subjecting and, and, um, and in an agony turn towards God, but it's usually in their relation with God. Why have you turned against us? Why are you silent? It's usually in this case, existential questions, but really humanistic, like existential questions that ra are raised in the 20th century and 21st century dominantly are absent in both um, in Attar's works um, and uh, as well as um, Mahmoud Akif Arsoy in Atlas. So in that sense, they are not modern at all. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. 
Actually, in that sense, if, if I could get the question of suffering, which one of the points that you made that I um, found very interesting is the difference between the biblical Job and the Quranic Job, and the fact that we have the biblical one kind of sleeping here. Why do you think is that? Why this choice, which, which is a choice that those people, those writers, made right yeah well uh, the motive i would say the motive was already there and um, they just simply picked up the motive and uh, the question why attar is very much using the the biblical job's motive um like Kermani in his book uh, goes into this historical survey and says uh, that there like there were some jews um in neishabur at that time and the chances are that um uh, that Attar was very much familiar with the biblical Job's motive, etc. So he also has some historical uh, surveys there. And then well, this motive comes um, to, to Anatolia and then sub Indian subcontinent. Yeah, no, I, I understand the, the process that you are talking about, but the, there is a difference between being familiar with a motif and, pick and it up. choosing, yeah, picking it up and not the other motif with whom I'm sure that he was familiar. So, so there is a, a conscious process here that I, I find very interesting. Yeah, as for the case of Iqbal, I can say, because he was a philosopher too. So my own PhD thesis was on Muhammad Iqbal's metaphysics. So that I can say, but Akif Arsoy is just a poet. Why he uses that, I don't know. Uh, one should ask him. Uh, but um, Iqbal um, is, um, in, in this sense, very modern because he emphasizes very much, like, uh, the the anthropology Iqbal introduces in his metaphysics is very strong. In a traditional Islamic philosophy and metaphysics, human being has no place. Everything is just filled. So uh, as this quotation, famous quotation by modern um, philosophers is that the God, the traditional God is so huge and big and spacious that leaves no room for him being. Whereas in, in modern uh, philosophies, um, the trend is towards um, even theology to place human being in the center and um, for Iqbal it's the same it's the same thing he for him human being is very important human being is uh, like he can unlike the Islamic tradition can stand before God and question God in, in and and just because um, he has the divine attributes he's just as important as God is so there is more room for him being and it's why he picked like he picked up this uh, motive I would say but also I have no idea um, now it's interesting and since we have a few more minutes we started a bit later than half past so I I, I really want to pick to pick on that point uh, for the uh, for Iqbal because you are an expert uh, in Iqbal, why do you think that he developed this kind of understanding? What was the influence of him distancing, or for this distance for more traditional ways of, of understanding? Is it, do, do you see it as familiarity with Western philosophy and with Anglo education? Yeah, he got his yeah. education in in um, in Germany. Uh, like he wrote his PhD, he was two just two years or at best. No, sorry, four years in Europe at Cambridge and um, in Germany, I think in Heidelberg and Munich. And um, he was very much familiar with uh, the German idealism. Um, in German idealism, human takes the center. And he was very, very well informed by um, Shia um, uh, philosophies where there are many uh, like new uh, ideas there so he just made a melange of all these um, new philosophical developments and his own um, preoccupation was to he was he was an Indian so Indian subcontinent was colonized so his own concern was to give back to Muslim um, it, at least Muslims in India um, the strong like self uh, strength like strength and self-conscious uh, like self um, confidence so that they could uh, like stand on their own feet and make their own destinies against um, the traditional understanding which was very much ashari which uh, which is very much deterministic everything is in the hands of god you should even in, the, in turkey to this day this is very dominant surprisingly enough that this taqdir this destiny is just 
something written there, up there, and you cannot change it. So Iqbal was against this idea. He regarded the future open. Nothing is determined by God. And you can just, um, God is a co-worker with man in leading this chaos of the universe towards a cosmos. So this was like very, um, so this was his preoccupation coming from a colonized country, Muslim country. No, which, which brings us back to question that, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, and sorry, Amir, about that, for more general discussion for the, these two days, of what is kind of the Islamic, what those traditions that we are talking about cover, when one of those so much associated with Islamic identity in the subcontinent actually step out of many traditional ways to introduce this European influence to redefine the Muslim, right? It's it's a fascinating. Iqbal is is absolutely fascinating on so many levels. Yeah, yeah. You you have a legitimate question. It is what uh, many who accuse accuse Iqbal of saying this is not Islamic Islamic philosophy. What he's doing, um, he keeps coding the Quran in any idea he has. He keeps coding the Quran and he finds the traces of his idea in the tradition, like um, in, in many different uh, philosophical and theological schools. And he insists what I am saying is Islamic, and the heritage we had is not Islamic. It is Hellenistic, so it is very much under the spell of the Hellenistic thought, and it's not at all Quranic. So his claim is, I'm going back to the Quran to build my own Islamic philosophy, which is very much a melange of Western and and uh, like Eastern and Islamic uh, tradition. But he's himself very innovative in that. And yeah, your question that what is the Islamic? Well, thank you very much. It's very yeah. intriguing this discussion. I actually have quite a few more questions, and I think that your paper uh, corresponds very in a very interesting way with some of the ideas that Eric uh, presented in his paper in our morning and his middle of the night uh, in the way of of trying to understand how these kind of traditions concepts were circulating in on the verge of the or in the modern world right in this huge so but i guess that we should leave that aside so i think that it's a great time to to thank our two speakers for very intriguing papers and discussions oh yes eric please i guess that it was a a morning accident yeah uh, amir i'm leaving it for you to close Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, Amir, the stage oh. is yours. Back to back oh. to the MC. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I'm glad we had a non-historian kind of close it because the whole endeavor was based around trying to expand limited perceptions of what it means to belong to the Turkic, the Arabic, the Persian tradition. And uh, this, just in terms of disciplinary uh, approach, gave us a greater expanse on what we're trying to kind of cover by talking about the turco tajik world, what it meant to belong to this world. Um, every single presentation um, that we've had these past two days um, fills me with great excitement for the follow-up to this project, which is the edited volume that will come out. We've had already, without reaching out to anyone, we've had uh, interest from Bloomsbury Publishing and uh, Cambridge Scholars Publishing has also approached us um, to ask for um, us to work with them in bringing forward the publication. So that is the, the next step. And I'll be sending out emails in the following days, uh, letting people know uh, what the next steps are in terms of getting the, uh, the research and the wonderful presentations that we've had onto paper. Other than that, I'd like to thank our two chairmen as well, uh, Ferenc and Roy. Thank you for joining us. You definitely added to the conversation by steering it in the right direction. So I'm grateful you joined us.
And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our attendees as well. We think as well. That was great. Yeah, thank you, Amir, for inviting me to take part in this. And uh, sorry, I couldn't attend yesterday. I'm, I'm sure that I missed some fascinating talks. But oh, that reminds me. I'm going to upload the recording of these uh, two days onto the SOAS YouTube channel. So day one and day two will be uploaded onto SOAS's official YouTube channel for us to review. I'll definitely be going back over these uh, presentations in the coming months. So please do the same. Terrific. Thank you. Cheers.